Play well with others. Share. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Patrick DeRay, Chief of the Bureau of Automotive Repair, and I want to welcome you to the fourth of our quarterly meetings for calendar year 2019. Our advisory group, uh, as most of you know, uh, meets uh, once a quarter to examine bar Bureau of Automotive Repair regulatory issues and uh, meet with our public. Uh, we've got a very diverse group uh, represented on the advisory group, a group that was appointed oh, about two years ago and serves four-year terms at the pleasure of the Bureau Chief. And it's something that's not necessarily set in statute, but a group that we have informally established to help guide the Bureau in its regulatory mission and its regulatory activities. And we're very pleased that we've assembled this group and it's been around for, oh, and, well, I've been doing this job for six years and we've, it's one of the things that helps guide me in my job and helps helps me tremendously. So uh, this is a really um, fantastic group and opportunity for us all to come together. Um, we're going to do a round of introductions as we usually do, and then we'll get started with the meeting. Uh, can we start with my far right, Megan? Hi, Megan McKernan, Auto Club of Southern California. Hello, Ruben Parra, California Automotive Teachers, Skyline College. Dave Robinette with ICAR, business uh, development in the Northwest region. Jack Moladonna for representing the California Auto Body Association. Uh, good morning, I'm Dave Cusa with Automotive Service Councils of California. Good morning, Christy Babb with the Automotive Oil Change Association. Good morning, Gary Conover with the California Automotive Wholesalers Association. Don Gallo, California Automotive Business Coalition. Uh, Bud Rice sitting in for Nikki Ayers with uh, IPA. Jeff Cox, Automotive Maintenance and Repair Association. George Ritz, California Automotive Teachers. Elisa Reinhart, California New Car Dealers Association. Lynch Gregory, AAA Northern California. Great, thank you. Uh, we also have uh, some introductions I'd like to make. Uh, my executive team, um, Shelley Whitaker oversees the consumer assistance program, that's the repair assist, smog check repair assistance and vehicle retirement programs, uh, the licensing unit. Many of you know Frenchie by her first name, Frenchie Mayuba, who oversees the licensing unit that reports, um, that position and that person reports to Shelley. We also have all things administrative, um, our facilities management, business services, contracts, personnel, and the like that also report through Shelley. And then Clay Leak. Many of you know Clay. He's given many a, many a presentation here on our smog check operations and our smog check database and communication system, also known as CalViz, California Vehicle Inspection System. Thank you, Clay, for being here. I've also um, Lucy Sarkeesian, uh, who's new with our office. I don't know if she was here at the last meeting. You were. Okay, I can't remember. Well, you're not that new anymore. Anyway, she's filling in for the regulatory update uh, today, le legislative and regulatory update. Uh, Holly O'Connor's on vacation in Ireland, lucky her. Uh, and Lucy will be filling in and, and providing that update uh, at the f fairly early in the agenda. I can't see behind, Wendy Baker, Wendy? Wendy's new to our office, our newest um, uh, staff member in the front office, sits at our front counter and takes a lot of the, the brunt of the calls and uh, questions that come through the front office. Uh, Zach Richardson, you guys all know Zach. Zach, Zach yeah, kind of our, my point person and a lot of our point, uh, person, um, our front office's uh, go-to person. Um, thank you very much, Zach, for being here. He's in charge of getting this meeting up, up and getting the notices out, so any questions go through Zach. Uh, Bryce, Bryce Penny, uh, Penny, sorry, Bryce. Uh, Bryce runs the uh, webcast, and we are being webcast as we always are um, through um, the department. And our webcast for any of those listeners out there um, can send a question or a comment 
to barmeeting at dca.ca.gov. And Bryce and or Zach will monitor that activity uh, to feed me any questions or comments so that I can read them into the meeting and uh, hopefully get an answer to any questions that come up. Again, that email address is barmeeting, all one word, barmeeting at dca.ca.gov. All right, we're going to kick off our meeting. Uh, we have something that I wanted to introduce at the beginning because we had a very, um, um, some sad news uh, that happened uh, very recently, and I think John's going to help us kind of uh, get this going, but uh, the passing of uh, a near and dear friend to all, many of us, um, Robert Barkhouse, Bob Barkhouse. John, if you would. Yeah, I appreciate that, Pat. Um, on September 21st, we lost a dear friend, mentor, and uh, just a great friend all around to the automotive repair industry, the Bureau of Automotive Repair, uh, to education, to Cal ABC, and so many other associations, ASCCA, CAWA, you name it. He helped form CAT, helped form Cal ABC. And Bob was just the most humble person you could ever know in your life. And to sit at his memorial and to hear of all his accomplishments, you never once heard Bob talk about that. And I thought it was appropriate with all the time he invested with the Bureau of Automotive Repair, helping write the smog check program, the testing for the smog check program, and for the inspectors and all the stuff he's done for education for our industry. I thought it was appropriate at this time to take a moment and honor him with a moment of silence. And thank you very much, Pat. Okay, thank you. I love that beard. Gail made sure that was the picture that you saw when you came in for his service because no one would ever have envisioned Bob Barkhouse with that beard. <laughs> thank you, John, for doing that for us all. We also will be um, putting in a, a nice little memorial uh, statement uh, and a picture in our upcoming fall newsletter. Okay, our first presenter today, Karen Nelson with the Department of Consumer Affairs Executive Office with some news that has just come to, well, our attention, but certainly information we want to share with everyone else. Some changes in the administration. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Karen Nelson, Assistant Deputy Director with the Office of Board and Bureau Services here at the Department of Consumer Affairs. Um, <coughs> Chief DeRay, Ad Advisory Committee members, thank you again for allowing the opportunity for us to give updates. Um, one of the very most important updates that we'd like to provide today is the appointment of a new director for the department. And we're pleased to share that on October 8th, 2019, Governor Newsom announced his appointment of Kimberly Kirchmeyer as the director of the Department of Consumer Affairs. Ms. Kirchmeyer, did the volume just go down? It was me, huh? Okay, sorry about that. I hear you, I think it's just fading in and out. Perfect. Um, Ms. Kirchmeyer enters her new role with many years at the department. She has served as executive director of the Medical Board of California since 2013, where she was deputy director from 2011 to 2013. She was Deputy Director of Board and Bureau Relations at DCA from 2009 to 2011 and Deputy Director at the Medical Board of California from 2005 to 2009, where she was Staff Services Manager from 2001 to 2005 and an Associate Governmental Program Analyst from 1999 to 2001. So as you can hear from all of those accomplishments, she's been um, here at the department and brings a wealth of knowledge as she comes on to her new role. She's also a member of the International Association of Medical Regulatory Authorities, Federation of State Medical Boards Committees, Administrators in Medicine, and the United States Medical Licensing Examination State Board Advisory Panel. Um, we all look forward to working with Ms. Kirschmeyers, um, and she comes on board later this month, um, and look forward to working with her and carrying out her vision for the department. I also wanted to share some news um, with the executive team. It's bittersweet to report that 
the departure of some of our colleagues at the executive team and in the executive office. Um, first, Chief Deputy Director Christopher Schultz has been appointed by Governor Newsom to now serve as Chief Deputy Commissioner at the California Department of Business Oversight. His last day with the department will be November 1st, 2019. On September 6th, Assistant Deputy Director Patrick Lay also took um, a, a, it was his last day at the department, rather, um, and accepted a position as a consultant with Assembly Business and Professions Committee. And I'd also like to report that I have accepted a position um, as Chief Impact Officer with American Leadership Forum Mountain Valley Chapter. It's a local nonprofit here in Sacramento, and my last day will be Thursday, October 31st. Um, I, I'd just like to say it's been a tremendous honor to serve the administration and be able to work with our 37 boards and bureaus here with the department. Um, and I will definitely miss working with all of you. Um, to my colleagues, Mr. Schultz, Mr. Lay, they've been very much integral members of the executive staff and their contributions to the department will be dearly missed. Uh, we wish them well in their next chapter of their careers. And I, I do realize I've, I've just mentioned a lot of transition, but please know that while we undergo the transition, we are committed to making sure that all of our boards and bureaus um, get the utmost customer service from our office and the Office of Board and Bureau Services. Our next update is with regard to the new publication called DCA We're Listening. I don't know if you had noticed once you entered this hearing room, there's a poster right there posted in the back um, called We're Listening. It's DCA's communications division's way of finding ways to improve the interactions of the public with DCA and our boards and bureaus to help them understand how to bring to you their concerns, comments, accolades, and complaints as effectively as possible. Um, the communications division created a simple visual of how to guide Californians who want to approach us. It's called DCA We're Listening, as I mentioned before, and it lays out everything that the public needs to know about giving feedback, and from public etiquette to meeting mechanics, and it's a guide, and it's a great primer for approaching the podium. The next um, update is with regard to the Future Leadership Development Program. The third cohort had its kickoff meeting on September 24th, 2019. Eight individuals were selected to be part of this year's cohort, and we look forward to reporting on the cohort's progress throughout the eight-month leadership program. And again, wanted to acknowledge Chief DeRay for being a mentor again this year. Um, I don't know if you all have heard, he's, he's done a wonderful job in supporting this wonderful program. And each of every single mentee he's had had just said wonderful things. And he's definitely one of our cheerleaders in making sure that our next bunch of leaders will be ready, ready to take on um, roles such as executive officers or bureau chiefs. So thank you for that commitment. Um, that concludes the department update at this time. Um, and as you all know, please feel free to give our office a call um, to, to see how we can help, and we thank you for your service. Thank you, Karen. Um, appreciate the update. Um, you're right. It is uh, very bittersweet. Um, I have enjoyed working with you and Chris and Patrick, um, who has been gone for a few weeks now, but um, you're upcoming departures will be tough um, because I've really enjoyed the work, sh work that we've been able to do over the last couple of years, the support you've provided me and the Bureau. Um, you just let us do our job, um, kind of check in once in a while to make sure everything's going smoothly, but um, we've been able to get a lot of things done over these last couple of years, and it's in large part just because of the, the way you, you let us do our job and um, um, kind of oversee things from a, from a distance um, without necessarily stepping in the way. Um, very conscious of um, uh, just the role that I play in this and um, have not tried to um, interfere with the things that we need to get done and, and have been very supportive in trying to help us get our accomplish our mission. So thank you so much um, for all the work that you've provided and support you've given and guidance you've given over the last couple of years. Very excited, of course, uh, with uh, being able to have a, a dir the director's position filled. Uh, I'm not sure how, it's, how long it's been vacant since um, the departure of Mr. Grafilo. I think it's over a year now, right? I believe it was April. This, April. 
this this year. It seems okay. It seems longer than that, but yes, um, we've had the position vacant for a number of months now, and uh, to have um, a new director in place and someone who certainly comes from within the department. Um, Ms. Kirchmeyer and I go way back uh, as uh, peers in this department, and she's been in an executive office position previously, um, but um, now returning to that role after a number of years at the medical board um, will be will be good to see some of the things that she's she has planned for the department. Mm -hmm. So looking forward to that as well. Anyway, thank you so much for everything, um, and I hope we can stay in touch. Thank you so much. It's been a delight working with all of you, especially with you, Chief DeRay. Um, I've enjoyed every moment of it. The last couple of years has been um, rewarding, a rewarding experience. And I, I know I've gotten to interact with some of you as well. And so thank you again for, for being a part of this committee. Um, I know it is advisory, but all of your perspective and your vantage points is very much important um, in furthering the, the work that the Bureau is doing. So thank you. Any questions or comments? We do have one, Mr. Peters. <laughs> Seems like just yesterday we spoke. Oh yeah, we did. <laughs> that mic is on. Oh yeah, uh, it was on. Push, there you go. Yes, uh, Mr. DeRay and uh, interested parties. I'm Charlie Peters, Clean Air Performance Professionals, a coalition of motors. And uh, we uh, have been here at this position with this comment uh, for uh, a number of years. And we have two things that we would like to see considered. One is that when a smog check is being done, that a previously failed smog check at a different station within the previous 60 days uh, be given note that the technician doing the smog check be given notice of that after all entries from him are put into the smog check before the certificate is issued. And that was a proposal that was generated in 92, approximately, out of a conversation with a member of the original Smog Check Review Committee from South Coast, Mr. Nazimi. And he says, if you can do something on a single piece of paper that will improve performance within the industry, we'll be happy to see what we can do about getting that implemented. We ended up right, and that was before any of the live data was generated. It was all done recording on tape and so on. That ended up being a significant letter that was provided to the governor and the entire legislature signature required, suggesting that, that that might have a significant improvement in performance of the smog check program. Second item we're wanting to have considered is that when doing a smog check, that something indicating possibility of warranty, if it's on the emissions label and so on, that the technician should, should have to take a look at that and enter that into the smog machine that gives him the awareness that this vehicle may be covered under warranty and also adds that to the database. We think that the combination of those two issues can improve the performance of the smog check program, which is costing the public in California a billion dollars a year at this juncture. We think it could double the effectiveness of that with a cost to the state of California that was, would get completely lost in even trying to find it. So we would like to see that considered. We've gone to two previous directors. We've had members of this committee that have gone along with us. We still don't have an answer. We're still not gonna go away. We still think that the public deserves better than what they're getting. So we would like any kind of guidance so we can get assistance in helping to get that considered because we think that's a minor issue that can provide real significant improvements in air quality and business st strategies to the state of California. And so we were, again, petitioning for any ideas as to how to get that accomplished. Thank you. Thank you. And nice tie, by the way. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you, Karen. All right, Lucy, front and center. Lucy. 
as I said, is going to be giving the presentation normally given by Holly O'Connor from our front office. Lucy is our, our second individual that we've been able to hire to help us with all of the legislative analysis of bills and uh, regulations, many regulations that are in the pipeline that we're working on. Mm -hmm. All right, take it away, welcome. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Lucy Sarkissian. I'm filling in for Holly. Um, I'll be providing the legislative and regulatory update, as mentioned. Um, this past year, the first year of the two-year legislative cycle, BAR was looking at 12 bills that were um, of interest to the industry, or to BAR. And um, of the 12 bills um, that were being tracked, five of them have been chaptered. And so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the five uh, bills that were chaptered, and then I'll let you all know which ones um, will be appearing next year or re being revived potentially. Um, so to start us off with, we have um, these five listed. So AB 142, AB uh, 596, AB 949, uh, 1538, and SB uh, 210. So the first one is the lead acid batteries. Um, this one was approved by the governor and it was chaptered on October 13th. Um, essentially, what it would do is um, increase the manufacturer fee on lead acid batteries from $1 to $2. And it would not apply to a person with regard to a replacement lead acid battery if a new motor vehicle dealer uh, sells or leases a used um, sells or leases a used vehicle which uh, has a replacement lead acid battery. And it also establishes a lead acid battery recycling facility investigation and cleanup program, um, which would be kind of overseen by the Department of Toxic Substances Control. Next we have is um, AB 596, Electronic uh, Authorization of Vehicle Defects. Um, this was approved and chaptered on October 3rd. And essentially it does two main things. And um, the first thing is it identifies for whom consumers can get copies of bulletins. Um, so one of them being the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, the manufacturer, or consumer publications. And additionally, um, it permits new car dealers to receive electronic authorization from consumers for any repair of a manufacturer recall. Okay. Next we have is AB 949, about which regards unsafe used tire installation. So this was approved and chaptered on September 6th. Um, essentially, uh, what it does is it prohibits an uh, ARD from installing an unsafe used tire, and it would require an ARD to use a visual inspection to determine whether a tire meets the criteria of an un unsafe used tire. Um, specifically, it provides that, a, that there are a number of unsafe tire examples uh, within the bill, including a tire with a tread depth that is worn to 230 seconds um, of one inch or less. Um, and this bill, I do want to make it clear that it does not apply to tire repairs, tire rotations, tire balancing, or a tire mounted on a wheel or rim that is temporarily removed from a vehicle and then reinstalled on the same vehicle. And then... We'll be doing a newsletter, a uh, more in-depth um, article in our newsletter on the 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 various provisions um, uh, kind of guiding what the various unsafe used tire examples are beyond the, the two thirty seconds uh, of one inch or less uh, tread depth. There's a number of provisions that consider a tire unsafe. And then next we have is AB 1538, the auto collision coverage. Um, this was chaptered or approved and chaptered on July 30th. Um, like ultimately what it does is it provides automob automobile physical um, damage or collision insurance payments to not interfere with a cons consumer's right to select the repair shop of the consumer's choice. Mm -hmm. um, it, a consumer has the right to choose a cash payment in the amount of the repairs that it would cost in lieu of proceeding with the repair to repair the insured damage. Mm -hmm. Um, and it does not prevent the insurance company from restricting payment if there's a case of suspected insurance fraud. And then lastly, it doesn't prohibit the insurer from requiring that a damaged vehicle be repaired when the safety features of the vehicle's operating system are substantially compromised. 
Um, next we have is SB 210. Um, the heavy duty smog check program. Um, this was chapter or approved and chaptered on September 20th. And um, for this one, it requires the Air Resources Board to adopt and implement a heavy duty um, inspection and maintenance program for non gasoline heavy duty on road trucks. And so, BAR's role with this bill, particularly, is kind of a consultative role. And um, so, kind of, we, we await for ARB if they have any questions or would like go further you're going to move to regulations next I um, just want to pause here for a chance to ask any questions or make any comments or observations related to the, the bills that were signed no yes mr. para Yes, um, on the electronic authorization, I assume that meaning text message, correct? Text message. I think they uh, had listed text message, email, just any electronic communication. Okay, because yeah. previously text message was not allowed, but so now it, it, text message is going to be allowed. Um, I don't know about that previously, just from the most recent uh, language it was included. It's included. Okay, thank you. Seems to have taken a page out of our book with our regulations that were adopted last year to allow for electronic authorization of a repair transaction between an automotive repair dealer and a, and a customer. Seems to have that same intention. I, I'm not sure that they tracked what we were doing, but it seems very timely that this bill went through right after, right on the heels of our adoption of our regulation. I can speak to that, Pat, if you'd like. Oh, okay. Um, so so um, vehicle sales is one of the items listed under Cal UETA is not, you can't use an electronic signature to um, consummate a vehicle sales agreement. And uh, recalls is also listed under Cal UETA. And so this was just an abundance of caution to make sure that those recall communications um, could be done electronically. Thank you. That's Elisa Reinhardt with the New Car Dealers Association. Any other comments, questions? We have Mr. Peters from the audience raising a hand. I just want to make sure that any of the advisory group members had a chance to speak. Nope, I think we're done. The, Mr. Peters. Yes, uh, I'm Charlie Peters, Clean Air Performance Professionals, the Coalition of Motorists. Uh, the first item on the nice lady's list of, of items was an issue having to do with batteries. In 1976, I was working for a battery uh, company in South Coast area. I took this finger and just mashed it all completely to nothing, and uh, the bone was just dust. Ended up putting it together. They suggested that I sue and so on, but I was there as a frontline supervisor working in the facility, reconstituting batteries into lead and so on. The situation there was unbelievably egregious. As soon as the end of the day was over and it was a 24 hour a day operation, the lead would start coming out of the stack on that outfit, and it, the air, that whole area has been under huge discretion continuously since 1976. It still is an issue. We're still playing the same game. We still don't have any problems solved. And I'm wondering if, uh, if there's any information as to how we're going to make this work now, because we've had a continuous waste of time looking at this, trying to take care of the public's health issues on the lead coming out of current operations, and we and I have not heard of anything that's going to make this any better at this juncture. Would love to hear how this, this is going to get improved, because I was there, and I decided it was, it was too big a hill to climb, ended up leaving after I had mashed my finger to, to nothing, and they wanted me to sue, and I was not interested in suing my company. So, so I would petition for additional information as to how we're going to improve public health in this system and make it to where it stops being a huge health impact to the public in California. Thank you, Mr. Peters. Um, perhaps we can reach out to our sister department, uh, the Department of Toxic Substances Control, and maybe get an update on this 
bill and implementation plans and overall lead acid battery safety and health concerns, as Mr. Suge uh, Mr. Peters suggested. Anyway, we'll look into that. Okay. Made it. Thank you. Um, so next we have, just kind of really quickly, our two-year bills. Um, these were the bills that did not make it through this year, but um, as part of the second year next year, um, these are all designated as two-year two bills. So you might see them coming from the dead um, back up on this one. Um, and so jumping into bar regulation, so we have a number of regulations that are currently being worked on both uh, by Holly and I. Um, so we're going to start off with the rehabilitation criteria for a licensure. Um, so this was in regards to Assembly Bill 2138, um, which required the establishing the criteria for determining the rehabilitation uh, of an applicant or a licensee when considering denial, suspension, or petition for a reinstatement of a license due to a criminal conviction, and also um, the criteria for determining when a crime is substantially related to the qualifications, functions, and duties of a license. So this one's kind of taken um, priority in much of our regulations just because of the adopted and implementation date deadline of July of next year. Um, so currently the status of our um, regulation package is that it's officially gone underway for the formal DCA-wide formal um, review process. Um, so once it's completed um, within the DCA review process, then we'll move, move to filing um, the 45-day comment period with OIL, the public noticing and the next steps of the rulemaking process. Next we have is the STAR uh, program cleanup. And essentially, it's doing um, three things, which are deleting outdated Gold Shield program provisions, amending the STAR eligibility um, criteria, and then revising the STAR suspension process to be consistent with statute. Um, currently, uh, BAR is revising the initial statement of reasons for DCA informal review. So once we get that approved by DCA legal, then we can proceed forward um, and do the uh, take the next steps within the DCA-wide formal review process. Um, next we have is the laws and regulations training. Um, this was the one that was split from a former regulation package and it intends to amend the, dis uh, the Bureau's disciplinary guidelines and establishes the laws and regulations training as a rehabilitation option for respondents who have de demonstrated an insufficient understanding of the laws and regulations protecting consumers in um, repair transactions. And specifically, the administrative law judges and the Bureau would have the option to require as a condition of probation or relicensure training and compliance with um, specified parts of the Auto, uh, Automotive Repair Act. So currently, uh, we officially at 3.30 p.m. yesterday received approval from DCA Legal to move forward with the DCA formal process. So um, we've, we are making progress on this regulation package. And um, so next week, we hope to submit for a DCA formal review on this regulation package. Next we have is the repair assistance um, regulation package, which um, the purpose of this package is to increase the smog check repair assistance participation by doing three things. One of them is providing higher repair contributions based on vehicle model year reducing the pre-repair diagnostic fees for low-income vehicle owners, and then removing any unnecessary eligibility restrictions pertaining to the vehicle registration. So currently, uh, BAR is revising the rulemaking uh, package based on the revisions or the comments we received from DCA Legal. So once we complete the uh, informal process, then we can move forward with the next steps of the, room, of the um, rulemaking process. Next is the licensing applications. Um, the licensing the licensing forms uh, regulatory package has two essentially two purposes. One is increasing the bureau's application review time if an application contains discrepancies, and um, this package also unincorporates uh, bars licensing applications and lists application components and regulation. So BAR is revising the rulemaking package uh, based on the feedback we, we received from legal's um, informal review. And then once we um, incorporate those questions, answer those comments, um, then we can proceed forward with the next steps, okay? And then our next regulation package is the smog, tra uh, smog check training providers. Um, and ultimately what it's doing is um, 
to make requirements for certification of smog check training providers consistent with current licensing requirements, authorized training for compliance with laws and regs. And um, so currently um, we are revising the rulemaking package based on the feedback we received from legal. And um, once we incorporate all that information, then we'll kind of resubmit to DCA legal and move forward with the informal review process. And then finally, in terms of our regulations, we have is the brake and lamp station and adjusters regulation package. Um, and the purpose of this package was to revise the ID numbers for station and adjuster licensing applications, license renewal and equipment requirements, update the handbooks, and um, the brake and lamp certificate of adjustment slash compliance. And so currently, um, Bar is just kind of updating the comments that we've received from DCA Legal, incorporating the amendments, answering questions, and then we will resubmit to, um, to the DCA Legal once all of that is completed. Do you all have any questions? Questions, comments? Uh, okay. Questions or comments from the advisory group? Mr. Parra. Parra with uh, California Automotive Teachers. Uh, specifically on the, uh, uh, the uh, training providers so what is it that's not being met right now what what um what requirements are not being met that we need to change because as far as i know uh schools such as my school we we're we're following their requirements so how are they uh, what what's what's not being consistent or what what is it that needs to be uh brought up to stature so i think um a couple years ago in 2012 or i remember there was a um uh, there was a change within the smog check programs. I think it was one and it became two for technicians and adjusters. And um, so what we are doing now is kind of updating um, on that end of all the, like the handbooks, the applications to reflect the change that took place. Hmm. Because as far as I know, there are two, two licenses, two, two, uh, two training um, sections, bar level one, bar level two. Um, so I'm, I'm confused as to what, what is not being met. What, what, is, um, what, what exactly needs to be changed to, to comply with the program? Because as far as I know, it is being complied with. I think everything's being complied with. It's just not consistent uh, with our current licensing scheme or our current licensing operation. We're in, as Lucy referenced, that we split the, the, the smog check technician license into two licenses, an inspector license and a repair technician license. And I think some of the certification requirements for the schools and instructors is going to be playing catch up. The regulations don't match or with our, um, our current licensing scheme. There might be some other changes and we can certainly have a presentation uh, provided at, uh, at a later date before the advisory group. And this one's just been kind of a, one that's been mired in uh, a lot of um, writing and rewriting um, to um, kind of meet the needs of our uh, legal counsel um, but I, and it's not to say that n things aren't being met by our certified instructors or uh, our schools. It's more to just make sure our regulations are in that regard are consistent with our current li current licensing s scheme or structure as I as I understand it. So the um, what what the concern is um, schools such as my school, um, you know, whenever we, ha we, we have to sub uh, implement change, we need two years to, to implement that change. So if something does come about where, uh, you know, when, when you say that we, we need to make sure that we're up to stature, um, that, that concerns me. Um, again, if we have to change curriculum or we have to make any, any kind of modifications to the program, it's got to before, it's got to go before our curriculum committee, it's got to go before our dean and, you know, up the, up the chain. So any kind of change would, we'd, we'd need to know I, again, at least two years, you know, in advance. Absolutely, and as many of you know, and have teased me about over the years, it takes five years to get a regulation through. So um, we'll have at least two years. Um, we'll give a presentation at some point um, uh, when we're more definite about what any requirements that are going to be placed on our schools or instructors. To my knowledge, there aren't any new requirements. I think it's just trying to make sure that our regulations are consistent with our current li current licensing program mm -hmm. and match in the, in the regulations that are speaking to that. But we'll get a more in-depth presentation. Um, but this is one we. Uh, when was the <laughs> when was the workshop last workshop on it? Yeah, so it's been a, it's, yeah, there you go, five years. Um, but 
Yeah, this one's just been kind of mired in in various um, discussions and planning and um, at the at the staff level, and it's still a ways away from being implemented. So we'll certainly give you the two years you need. Uh, question over to my left, uh, Mr. Rice. Hi, uh, Bud Rice. Hi, hi Lucy. Um, quick question on the repair assistance slide. Mm -hmm. um, for the benefit of the group, obviously, repair assistance is to help low-income people keep their vehicle in the fleet. Basically, that's the story. I'm having trouble with um, number two. It looks like number one is uh, providing higher repair con uh, contributions based on repair vehicle year. Okay. Uh, if you look at number three, removing unnecessary eligibility restrictions pertaining to vehicle registration. Okay. In other words, it's, it still allows the shop to help that customer keep their vehicle in the fleet. Number two is a little funny, though, and I'm, I, I, maybe I'm reading it wrong, but it says it reduces pre-repair diagnostic fees for low-income vehicle owners, which would lend itself for somebody to think, you're still going to have to do the work, but now the repair assistance you might get to help that customer has been reduced. That's what it, that's what it looks like to me when I read that sentence. So what, um, what I can do is, I don't know how to answer your question right now, but um, kind of looking into the regulation language, maybe I can look deeper to see what the intent um, of that is. Um, but I know it's supposed to assist consumers who want to get their uh, vehicles surrendered. So. Right. Thank you. Right, Thank you. right now, the and I'll just speak broadly to it. Right now, the um, consumer is on the hook for all of the diagnostic costs. And the state is currently capped although this regulation package, is, package in, intends to increase it to up to $1,200, depending on the, the model year of the vehicle. Um, but right now we're capped at $500 um, for repair assistance. Many of the, by placing, as I think the folks at the, uh, in, within our consumer assistance program, and specifically who run the repair assistance component of that program, have found is that many consumers are walking away from from the repairs because the diagnostic fees are chewing up a lot of the $500 and they get the bill for the, for the actual repairs and then they walk away from it. And we're trying to get people to repair their cars, encourage them to repair their cars. So I think we're changing how that is structured to reduce that impact by allowing as much money as possible to be um, Picked up by the twelve hundred, the, the the increased amount that we're now going to be paying for the repairs um, but, under but, this program. But that, but that would seem as though you would then enter into a contractual obligation with the shop to say, do these eight things for this money, and mm -hmm. then the shop could say, okay, I could do those eight things for that money, and then that would move the rest of the money over to being used for actual re repairs. But without something like that. The shop is left to try to figure out what I can do diagnostically speaking to try to get to something that works for the customer's perspective. But if you limited the steps that somebody had to do to make that decision, and for that they got a compensation rate of X, okay, then, then I could kind of see how that might work. Yeah, we'll have to take a look at that. I'm not sure that that's the case, that we're looking at limiting any options for diagnosing or di uh, trouble troubled trees that you might be going through to, to, to do the, to diagnose that vehicle. Um, we'll, we'll certainly check with the staff, but the, the intent was to uh, encourage consumers to move forward with the repairs and take away that burden of having to foot the bill for the entire diag diagnostic process. So we've had a workshop on this. Um, so, but again, it um, it was uh, earlier this year, and we can come back to that at a, in 2020 with another workshop because we're getting closer to to the point at which we would be filing these regulations with OAL. They're pretty they're in pretty good shape. I think we won't have too much trouble getting them through the department in our formal review throughout that throughout the, de the department um, and we'll come back to it with a workshop probably at the beginning of the year to answer questions like that thank you anyone else All right. your laws and regulations training is uh, jack is uh, <laughs> gotten a special call out and it's on the fast track as you can here, you've heard from Lucy that uh, we now are in DCA-wide formal review. Uh, it was tied to the package that um, Mr. Para had 
mentioned earlier, um, and that one was just kind of languishing, so we kind of split the two apart. And uh, as you can see, it's, it's moving along. Any questions, any further questions, comments? Okay. Well, Lucy stepped away, so I don't think I would have been able to. Oh, she's done, yeah. <laughs> she dropped the mic, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on. Our next uh, presenter, Clay Leak, with our executive office, going to give us an update. I think it's a fairly brief one. We're getting close to the finish line here with the California Vehicle Inspection System Transition Project Update. Boy, that's a mouthful. <laughs> Calvis Project Update. Welcome, Clay. Thank you. Good morning. All right. Thank you for the introduction, Pat. Um, today, I'm here to give, hopefully, what is the last update uh, relative to the transition of the California Vehicle Inspection System, or the CalViz. Uh, in terms of scope, just a quick uh, refresh. We had several objectives, the first of which was to negotiate ownership of the system that supports smog check, or the CalViz. Refresh the system to a state-owned data center, which is complete. Publish an award and RFP to obtain ongoing maintenance and operation services, which is complete. And finally, transition those maintenance and operation services to a new vendor, which has been uh, in flight since the contract was awarded in June, and we are actively working on completion of. And I'll give you a little bit more detail with regard to that activity in a second. Uh, in terms of our baseline completion dates, um, I don't know that I want to go through all these in detail, but as I mentioned, the contract was awarded on June 4th, and we are actively marching towards a transition of 10-31-2019 at 11 midnight, basically. A uh, quick summary, uh, some high-level details of the new contract. As I mentioned, 11-1 uh, will begin the new M&O period with the new vendor, Encore, Encore LLC. Uh, the duration of the contract is a five-year contract with five one-year options. Uh, quite, a, quite a bit of difference in the statement of work, and, and I've actually got a presentation uh, subsequent to this one, and I'll kind of talk through some of the details of, of those changes, but certainly one of the goals is to really um, remove some of the barriers and increase our um, ability to be flexible and increase the velocity of change and be able to improve the system more rapidly as, as those needs arise. Certainly some updated service level agreements with increased financial penalties, um, accountability and system uptime is again something I'll cover in my next presentation, but something that's obviously really critical to everybody in this room, uh, consumers, industry, bar, et cetera. And finally, really proud to, to be able to announce that obviously the, the cost per test is being reduced quite a bit from $1.08 to 70 cents per test, which over 10 years is gonna represent about a $46 million savings to the industry, something I'm really proud of. I'm um, actually optimistic that we can continue to, to shave that cost per test down through the life of this contract as well. So something I'm really committed to. Uh, in terms of next steps, again, the transition is occurring on October 31st or November 1st, depending on which side of the that date you're on. But um, as of right now, we have actually a few more stations enrolled than I have mentioned up here. We are actually at 5,607 stations enrolled with Encore, which represents about 76% of all stations and 88% of the total test volume. So uh, the Encore team has done a fantastic job reaching out to stations and getting folks to enroll. Um, I don't see any issues with program coverage as we approach this transition date. Um, the velocity of, of folks enrolling is still between 50 and 100 in a day, depending on weekend, weekday. Um, so I, I, in my mind, we're there uh, in terms of program coverage supporting a successful transition. Another um, point to discuss is the push towards ACH and getting stations away from paying with test fees with checks. Uh, I think this is a really positive shift for, for the industry, for BAR, and for our vendor as well. Um, processing ACH is just a far more efficient way to process these payments. 
Um, the new uh, billing portal is something I think that the industry will really like, having their transactions available online to view through their portal, um, see their billing balances, see their tests, and get all their billing data in one place online, I think is something that will be a great improvement. Uh, prompt payment of SGS invoices. So another um, topic I wanted to touch on today, obviously as SGS rolls out, um, it is extremely critical that all stations pay their outstanding invoices. Uh, they are required to pay those invoices and, and stay, stay current um, with those debts. So I encourage all stations to promptly pay SGS as soon as possible. I know a lot of stations are in the habit of waiting 60 days, 90 days to pay. Um, I would really encourage stations to try to, um, to get current with SGS as soon as possible following the 1031 date. Knowledge transfer is ongoing. A um, lot of Encore folks on the ground uh, obtaining knowledge about the system, job shadowing with SGS resources. Um, testing of the new billing system, which is going into place, is ongoing. All the results are, are excellent thus far. And finally, a lot of work going into establishing internal tools, processes, that will be used to care and feed the system going forward. Uh, so lastly, before I wrap up, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge a couple folks um, from the SGS team that have worked with us uh, over the last long period of time to help us support the system. Kelly Bertrand is here, and I'd appreciate it. Maybe if you could stand up. Yeah, there you are. Uh, Kelly's been with the program for since the very beginning, I think 14 or 15 years. We so um, I want to you know, recognize her for all the work she's done supporting the Smog Check program and moving us forward to the point where we're at today. So thank you, Kelly, very much. I appreciate all the work that you've done. I'd also like to recognize Eric Schwarz, who many of you recognize from this presentation, who's been with us for <laughs> a little bit short. Oh, come on, stand up. Come on, stand up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Eric joined us two or three years ago and has been very instrumental with CalVista being successful. Um, you know, helped us bring in the right resources to get this, this project done and put us in a position that we were able to establish this cost savings and really put the, put the program from a technology perspective in a, in a spot where we're able to move forward and, and, um, and, and fulfill our vision and our mission and the things that we really care about and support everybody uh, across the state of California. So thank you both for all your work. Um, and that said, I think that concludes this presentation. Any questions? Well, I'm glad you did that. Thank you very much, uh, Clay, not just for the um, presentation, but for the acknowledgement of the fine work of SGS Tescom. And um, I was going to say and echo your comments. Um, they've been tremendous partners. Um, um, we've developed many great friendships with uh, many of the, the staff and the, the management team. Um, Kelly and Eric, thank you so much for all the work you've done. Um, uh, really a, uh, an amazing partnership and a tremendous success story. The, the, I think it has been about, well, I came back to the Bureau in 2007. I remember, when, if, if not my first meeting, one of my first meetings was a meeting that Kelly and I participated in, and um, that's when we first met. And you'll probably remember that it was right after the bill to exempt not just the first four model years, but it changed to the first six model years at that time. And that was not envisioned by anyone when the bidding uh, began a couple years before that. Um, so we were in a room and talking about what we were gonna do to, to address that. And I believe we ended up amending the contract to, to take care of that, that unexpected legislative change uh, to our program. But um, it's, been a, it's a, been a great run. Um, the work that you've done over the last 12, 14, 15 years, uh, an amazing, um, something you, sh you should be proud of, we all should be proud of, and the fact that uh, this is a program that um, smogs a million vehicles a month. Um, that's more than many states combined over the course of a year. Um, so it is a, a tremendous, um, a, tr a tremendous uh, program that uh, couldn't have been done without all of your leadership and support. So thank you so much, Kelly and um, Eric, and the rest of your team. Please pass on um, our our thanks, and uh, we hope to stay in touch. Any other comments or questions? Yes, Mr. Kusa. 
So Clay, from a shop owner's perspective, the transition was easy. So thank you. I'm very happy that I can not have to, I'm a very low volume OIS <laughs> shop, so I don't have to write $5 checks anymore, which makes me so happy because I know it costs more than $5 to process it. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then um, uh, glad to hear that, that you know, approaching 90% approaching have, have transitioned. Um, is there a plan for this last couple weeks of November to remind those that haven't transitioned that they need to get it done? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're really trying to balance over communicating and bothering stations versus being useful. Um, but certainly, um, yeah, stations are receiving phone calls from the Parsons help desk, one of Encore's subcontractors. Um, even bar staff are pitching in on some of those calls where we're encountering maybe folks that, you know, don't realize this is really happening or aren't aware of the transition. So we've got bar staff involved. Yes. So a lot of communication. Um, but you know, the fact that we're getting 50 to hundred a day tells me that w I think we're, we're kind of fulfilling our part in terms of communication and outreach. Great, thank you. Yep. And thank you for acknowledging the ease. That's yeah, yeah, the ease of signing it. up. That's very nice to hear. <laughs> Other questions, comments, concerns, not from the advisory group, Mr. Peters. Yes, uh, Mr. DeRay and uh, interested parties, uh, I just for the first time heard uh, who this contractor is going to be just a couple of moments ago, and that is it's Parsons. Parsons has been an integral part of the system of deciding which cars pass and which cars fails and wanting to be the contractor of this program for quite a number of years. We reported significantly on that in March of 2000, reporting how ma major members of the Bureau of Automotive Repair staff, the chief of staff, head of engineering, et cetera, were actually participating in the implementation of the Parsons program in, in uh, New Jersey, which they run yet today. They were the referee in, in, in the California program. They're very significantly involved in major business and appear to be partners with Volkswagen and Shell and we're concerned that this is an effort about the possibility of going to electric self-driving autonomous cars and eliminating this operation. So we think that that deserves some additional look before it goes forward, if that's possible. And uh, we think that uh, that needs a uh, more thorough review before we go forward. Thank you. So just uh, to clarify Parsons' role. So Parsons' role in this particular contract is very limited. They, they, their role is just limited to billing and help desk support. Um, Encore, Consul Encore LLC is the prime contractor, and, and they'll be more involved on the smog check side. Parsons' role is very, very limited to a narrow, a narrow piece, which I mentioned is just the billing and, and help desk for stations. So, Thank you. And... Um, I understand your interest in um, uh, looking at issues like autonomous vehicles and the sort, but this contract is not set up for that. It's a, simply, very simply, a maintenance and operation of the smog check database and communication system. But not to say we shouldn't be looking at that. It's just this contract won't be able to get into those uh, those areas. Thank you, Mr. Dury. Thank you. Anything else? All right, Clay, are you up round, again? Yes, you are. Round two. We did this. Uh, we did this uh, with some method uh, to our madness, uh, setting you up back-to-back -back, uh, presentations now, to um, kind of looking at the Calvez system and what it really is. We've talked about it. Everybody kind of knows what it is, but I think you're going to get into some more of the details of. Uh, what's what's the guts behind it and, uh, and the nuts and bolts that run the system and maybe kind of talk about where we're going or some ideas we, we're looking at. So operating enhancing the Calvis system. Uh, again, Clay Leak, thank you. Thank you very much. So um, as, as we kind of move forward um, into a new, uh, working with a new vendor um, and under the framework of a new contract, one of the things I really wanted to focus on 
as part of that transition and part of this next you know, five to 10 years of managing the program is a real focus on the strategic management of the system and really, really making sure that the changes that we make to the system, which ultimately influence the program and touch thousands of technicians and millions of consumers, um, really making sure we're making the right investments, we're making the right changes. And I think that that process is something we've always done, but it's a process I've really wanted to, to focus on more and bring some light to and bring more, more folks into and um, really bring as many stakeholders to the table and get as much input as we possibly can before making decisions to make changes because those changes cost money. So I think um, I'm hoping with this presentation to kind of plant some seeds and, and start um, to get even more engagement, not that, not that you know, folks from BAG and other stakeholders aren't involved, but I really want to um, continue to pull more people in and get more input so we can make the best decisions possible um, investing in, in changes to the program. So that said, you know, the, uh, the California vehicle inspection system, the CalViz is complex. It's comprised of hundreds of virtual machines, hundreds of physical assets, probably thousands of logical pieces of, of components, um, web tier application, database tier, extremely complex network design for security purposes, uh, numerous internal applications that bar staff use, uh, numerous interfaces with multiple business partners, DMV, the state bank, Air Resources Board, just to name a few, the referee. Um, so the point I'm, I'm trying to get at is this, is this is a very complex, there's a lot of moving parts here. So making changes sometimes touches hundreds if not thousands of different pieces of the system and all that has to be documented, all that has to be tested. So getting into a few, a little bit kind of more detail behind the system, uh, multiple sites. There's a site in San Diego, disaster recovery site in San Diego. There's the primary site, which sits here in Rancho Cordova. Very complex real-time data replication processes that make sure we never lose data um, back and forth between the two primary site and the, and the disaster recovery site. Very complex ETL processes, extract, transform, load processes that allow us to present data to different stakeholders. Uh, obviously, the BAR OIS and BAR 97 platforms that we integrate with and processing real-time smog checks, OLTP, online transactional processing. Uh, an Oracle exit data um, environment, a very complex state-of-the-art database environment uh, that, that it takes a lot of care and feeding. T multiple environments. This system supports multiple stakeholders, and the way we're able to do that is multiple environments. That does create complexity. All of the environments have to be tested. Every time we make a change, those changes have to get pushed through to those environments. Development, integration, system test, our UAT environment. We have three sandbox environments that support different types of testing, external uh, manufacturer test, equipment manufacturer testing, um, internal certification testing. We have an environment for ETS manufacturers, BAR 97 manufacturers to test our future iterations of code. So by the time we deploy it, it's already tested and we know it's not gonna break anything out in the field. And again, some of the interfaces I mentioned, interfaces with our vid contractor, um, SGS Encore, and Parsons for the billing pr uh, portion that I mentioned, integration with DAD vendors that I mentioned for testing, schools, stations, BAR, the DCA licensing feed, another very complex interface, the interface with DMV, which is pushing real-time certificates to DMV, obviously extremely important, state bank, referee, air resources board. So again, the point I'm driving at, this is a very complex system, a lot of care and feeding and a lot of effort when we make changes to make sure we don't break something. This slide I like to call the Michelin man meets the Smurfs. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> there were some better slides, but they were all copyrighted and this is the one I ended up finding. Um, but the point here, we have a lot of stakeholders that are, that are looking for this system to change. They want changes. Mr. Peters, you know, was just up here talking about a couple changes that he's really passionate about and really wants. And, and, and he's a great example of a stakeholder that, that sees an opportunity to improve the program and, and we need to make changes to the system to accommodate that. So there's always stakeholders looking for change. We also have got a different group of stakeholders that want stability. They want uptime, right? Our stations and our technicians demand that system be available, that the smog check system be available. Because if it's not, they're not able to make a living, right? So the development groups are ultimately the groups supporting the change and our IT operations group are generally the groups supporting that stability. So there's a constant conflict there and that's a conflict. It's hard to balance at times because you wanna make program changes, you wanna improve things, but you also wanna keep the system stable and available. And that's a hard line to walk sometimes. So on the operations side, 
ensuring the stability and the availability of the system requires a significant amount of resources. And this is just an example of some of the activities that go on on that side of the house. And I don't want to, you know, I realize this is probably boring for a lot of folks, but um, we have very formal processes for incident management, problem management, capacity management, continuity management, availability management, all very formal disciplines within the IT management space that, that we have very defined processes and procedures that we follow. Patching and security, you know, these hundreds and thousands of, um, of components need to be patched. Some are routine patches. Other patches are, are emergency. They have to be put in right now. We have to drop whatever we're doing, get that security patch in, and do the associated testing. So those are activities that take away from your ability to increase the velocity of change because you have to make those changes to keep the lights on. Hardware and software refresh, these, you know, these components go end of life and have to be replaced. Again, requires a ton of planning, a ton of work to take those components out and replace them. 24 by seven monitoring. There are people monitoring this, sub, this system around the clock. If something uh, barfs in the middle of the night, there's somebody somewhere waking up in the middle of the night, logging into the system and seeing what happened. And potentially a whole bunch more people waking up to address whatever, whatever happened in the background. Um, defect correction and verification, there are constantly issues that have to be remediated and resolved. Again, all this takes testing, careful planning, and, and 24 by 7 monitoring and care. User acceptance testing, you know, a lot of this work falls onto the bar site as well, making sure the changes that we're making, the fixes that we're making aren't breaking things. Uh, a lot of testing on the vendor side, but a lot of testing on the bar side as well. And finally, anytime we make a change, there are thousands of pages of procedures, technical documentation, and training that have to occur. If we change a upgrade to a new backup solution, there's a backup procedure that has to be updated. So again, I don't wanna bore everybody with the details of care and feeding of the system, but the point I'm trying to make is there is a ton of work just to keep the lights on and keep the system stable. Uh, currently, we have about 81 open incidents, and that's a trend. Generally, we're around 81, 80 to 100 things. Basically, an incident is, is a problem with the system something that has broken that we need to fix. So the point being, there are always issues to look at. There are constantly incidents to manage and, and resolve. So on the change management side, this is kind of a high level overview of the process. A CMR is needed to implement new business requirements. This change has a life cycle. Uh, the, the request is followed by a detailed analysis, design, development, testing, implementation, acceptance, and then the subsequent documentation. So every single one of these changes, a change could be 20 hours, it could be 10,000 hours. It just depends on the scope. And in terms of the impact, we're always looking at baseline requirements, we're looking at our design specifications, the actual code development, uh, integration testing, user testing, training, uh, training the help desk so they can answer calls about a new functional change um, that may impact stations or technicians or other stakeholders, changes to internal applications that allow us to manage, um, the program, connectivity partners, maintenance and operations, obviously the test equipment that, that these changes may impact, and then you know, back-end stuff like the database and the network. So currently, we have 162 open changes on the table. And that's a lot, and that's probably more than we should have, and I wanna talk a little bit about why there is that, that many changes on the table and kind of what the plan is going forward to start kind of weeding through that and making sure that we're prioritizing the right changes. So I say this all the time, and my, my team's probably sick of hearing it, so I'm really glad I have a new group of people that, to say it to, because everybody else is tired of me hearing it. But the question that I always come back to is, is the juice worth the squeeze? Right? When we talk about changes to the system, why are we making the change? Right? What's the benefit? Is there a, is there a hard cost savings? Is there a, is there a, um, are we aligning with a new law or a new regulation? Uh, how does it align with our vision and mission? Right? How are we, are, are we helping to protect consumers? How are we impacting air quality? Uh, what are the impacts to key stakeholders like technicians, inspectors? Um, do we have the resources available or is this something that's gonna require a new contract, right? What's the impact to resources at BAR? What is the impact to the, the contractor resources? Uh, does it align with the contract? Is it something that's gonna require a contract change? So opportunity cost. So we've recently had several really large projects. First was the development of the CalBAR OIS. A huge multi-year, four to five year effort, took a ton of resources. CalVista, a huge, huge effort, and one that was absolutely required by law. We didn't have a choice. 
CalVista wasn't something we decided to do. CalVista was something we were required to do. So when I talk about opportunity cost, you know, one of the reasons there's 162 changes pending is because for the last 10 years, we've had our heads down in project mode, first with CalBar OIS and then with CalVista. So starting 11.1, we really have, for the first time in a long time, we're entering a period where we're truly in a maintenance and operations phase. And I think we have a real opportunity to accelerate the velocity of change to the system while maintaining that stability. So quantitative versus qualitative, you know, one of the things I, I hope everybody leaves this presentation with is, a, is, is the realization that we wa I want your feedback, Bar wants your feedback. The more people that are providing input to the types of changes and, and what we change, I think the better, the better decisions we'll be able to make. But ultimately, I always want to look at the quantitative versus the qualitative value of, of what these changes are and what they represent. If you come to me and you tell me we can save the state $46 million, that's a, that's a, that's a hard cost. That's a, that's a quantitative number. A qualitative value is, is, I'm not saying it's not compelling, but it's harder to justify at times, right? So when we talk about changes, one of the things I always want to challenge stakeholders that are providing input and want changes is bring me quantitative data. Bring me something that's measurable, and that's a much more compelling reason to make a change. So finally, a few ch changes that we have been able to kind of recently complete. Um, obviously, the certificate blocking and referee direction, something I'm really proud of that I think's had great impact across the industry. Automated, automated equipment and data anomaly lockouts. Self-service limitations is something we've recently put into place. Uh, clean gassing vehicle direction. A bunch of dad driver updates. The BAR 97 wrong platform prompt, which I know um, several BAG members were really excited about. It isn't done being implemented, but is, is being rolled out right now. So that's something I'm really glad we were able to get, get up and running. And finally, a ton of changes related to the transition. So certainly not a complete list, but um, I just want to make the point that, you know, we are doing what we can to, to make changes that positively impact the program and, and, and consumers and air quality as we've been through this challenging time of, with a huge workload. So quickly, I also wanted to go through kind of a list of future changes as well. Um, I don't know that I want to deep dive into any of them, but certainly glad to have discussions. I, these are just some of the bigger ticket things that are on the table right now that I'm really looking for input on and looking for to help prioritize and help get onto the roadmap. So um, integration of a new DAD, a uh, lot of um, security enhancements we've been looking at related to the DAD in addition to bug fixes and um, addressing uh, in, uh, communication issues with specific vehicles. Uh, adding safety recall data to the VIR. I know this is something that we've been talking about for quite some time and something that we actually now have the data available to us to start, to start making this. So this is one of certainly my priority changes. I think it's a real opportunity to educate consumers through the smog check process about any open recalls that their vehicle may have, safety recalls. Uh, another interesting one is displaying inspection information messages specific to the errors we're, we're finding during the smog check process, process so a consumer can leave with a much more informative message on their VIR about what's actually wrong with the vehicle. Um, here's a change that Mr. Peters may be very excited about, which is actually displaying vehicle specific emissions warranty messages um, as part of a smog check failure. So if, you, if your vehicle has a PZEV warranty, um, if we're able to capture some data off the underhood label, we, we, ha we have the capability to tell that consumer you failed, and not only did you fail, but you have a PZEV warranty that's good for 150,000 miles. Please go see your, your, uh, your manufacturer before you pay for a repair. Uh, some other op ideas moving forward, biometric scans in lieu of entering a bar 97 password, a bar OIS password, excuse me, again, enhanced authentication. Uh, we have, as we mentioned, um, been looking at a new generation of data acquisition device to support the bar OIS, expanded data collection to help with fraud prevention, uh, connectivity to, you know, mo more modern vehicles. GPS, data encryption are just a few of the additional features we're looking at for this device, but there will be more presentations on the DAD, a new DAD before we do anything uh, dramatic requiring a new, any new equipment. Uh, break and lamp inspection software. I think a lot of people, obviously, paper certs are, you know, still in, in play for the break and lamp program. It's something I'd love to automate, just like um, CalBar OIS. Uh, smog check test fee pre-purchase is something we're looking at as opposed to paying for those 
uh, smog check fees after the fact. It could be uh, something similar to certificate purchases where you purchase them up front and it makes the process even more seamless. Uh, transition from on-prem to cloud hosting, uh, again, something kind of more in the back end, but the entire IT industry is really looking at, you know, iron on-prem to cloud computing as a huge driver for cost savings. So certainly something we are looking at as well and something that's on our roadmap. And finally, bar 97 certificate blocking is, is something else that we would love to do, look, look, at, look at moving forward. So finally, in summary, I've probably gone a lot longer than I meant to do. I apologize, but um, you know, the CalViz is large and complex. It's not easy to make changes. It's expensive to make changes. Uh, we've had several really large projects that I think have reduced the velocity of change. And I, I think moving forward, that's something we really have an opportunity to improve. And that's something I really want help with and, and involvement with and input on. Balancing the velocity of change and stability is ultimately my goal. Take the availability of the system really seriously. It's something um, we cannot sacrifice, but at the same time, I think we have some alternatives to improve the velocity of change. And as I keep touching on the input from stakeholders is critical. So please keep the ideas coming. I'm always available to talk about proposed changes. Um, I'd also like, I know I've introduced Greg Millard, if you could stand up as well. Greg Millard is the Encore program manager. Um, Encore will be uh, very involved with strategic discussions as well. So Greg is a resource to you. Greg is a resource to all stakeholders um, to talk about proposed changes, different ideas as well. Um, and that's all I got. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Clay. Very interesting presentation. Um, I'm never bored by it, but um, I, I, I appreciate your uh, in-depth analysis of what what is what we mean by Calvis and what what um, what it means to ask to make a change that affects the Cal or that's impacted or run by the Al Calvis pro system. Um, any questions or comments from our advisory group members, Mr. Jeff Cox? On the 162 open changes, are, are there themes to those changes? Uh, and, and maybe talk a little about how you're going to prioritize which ones you're going to work on first? Yeah, there's certainly different categories. Some are back-end changes that you wouldn't notice any diff change in functionality. Um, I think I really did my best to highlight some of the bigger heavy-hitting functional changes in the list I just presented. Um, you know, I, I go back to is the juice worth the squeeze? I mean, that's how we're going to evaluate all these changes. We're going to look at what's the benefit to the to consumers, what's the benefit to air quality, what's the benefit to industry, and and really try to make objective decisions about about which ones make it to the top of the list. You obviously also have to look at the flip side of it, which is how much time and energy does it take to implement that change, right? And and how does that weigh against the potential benefit? Um, and and that's sometimes a gray area. And, and that's really why I think the collaboration and the communication is so key um, because we don't always understand the benefit, right? And I think the more input we get, the better we can understand those potential benefits and the potential impacts. Mr. Rice. Um, hi, Clay. Uh, so I, I have a little hit list I thought I would just rattle off real quick. <laughs> <laughs> Zach, um, are you taking notes? 160. I don't have a pen. <laughs> 62 and counting. <laughs> um, all right. Now, the first thing I wanted to say is I agree with Dave. The ease of use and the transition has been great. I, all, all of my shops have flipped over, and, and it, there wasn't a hiccup. There, there wasn't anything. So I just want to, again, to commend Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. that. Um, how, one, one thing I wanted to say, though, what, and there was, I didn't say but. <laughs> <laughs> but. One other thing I wanted to say was during the discussions we've had over these long, many months, if not years, on this transition move, um, Encore is the name of the vendor, correct? Do I have that right? Um, I, I also didn't realize that Parsons was involved in the thing until actually Charlie called me and said, hey, did you know Parsons was involved with these guys? And I go, no. And then I got my pack, like Dave was saying, that you fill out to get the swap over, and that's when I saw Parsons finally in the thing. Now. For everybody in the room, that probably doesn't mean anything to anybody other than those of us that have been here forever that went through the ground wars on who was going to do smog check because vendors were trying to do the smog check program versus small business owners. And this was a knockdown, drag out fight 
of which Parsons was part of that discussion, okay? So today, if you were to say, hey, we have a vendor and they have partnerships and different components are gonna help put this thing together and one of them is Parsons and that ended up being the correct answer and that ended up being something that made sense, I think we'd all go, oh, okay. But this felt a little funny because it was kind of set in stone and this is how it was gonna be. Oh, by the way, these guys are the guys that are in the background. Now, now you're saying that they're only gonna be involved in a couple of things, mostly administrative in nature, but from an experience level and their ability to impact the marketplace, Encore is this big and Parsons is this big, okay? So there's probably gonna be some behind the scenes help that Parsons is gonna deliver to Encore, of which I also don't have any problem with I only wish it would have been up front. That, that, that's my only comment about that. I wish it would have been up front. Um, he, second thing is oh. when Charlie was making the comment about the what, what we call the flag, where you were you made a comment about that is maybe we can do some changes in the future. Um, moving from a platform that I would determine to be a lock system back to bar 97 to something we're moving towards today, where maybe there is some ability to move some things around and and make some changes, I think that's fantastic. And for those in the audience, the idea here would be somebody does a smog check, they get to the end of the smog check, a flag pops up and says, hey, this car failed two weeks ago somewhere else. That technician's gonna go, whoa, why is that? And they're gonna go back through and then really take a look at this stuff. And I understand he should be doing that anyway, but they're really gonna slow down and try to figure out Am I right or am I not right? Did I make an oops here somewhere along the line? And at the point where they've either caught something that they may have missed, or they're now perfectly comfortable in what their decision is to say, commit, all of those cars become undercover cars. So the ability to enhance performance and somebody's behavior based on just that could be dramatic. Okay, so, so, so again, I'm backing up what Charlie said there. What's funny about those things and the changes with what you said about the PSEV um, ability for, for a customer to see that they've got PSEV uh, coverage is I understand what you're saying about you have to bundle these things. You can't say, oh, Bud wants to have this change, and then two weeks later, you're trying to get the vendor to make some changes behind it. No, you got to bundle these things up so that this might become part of another release down the road over here, but then it allows the vendor to do sandbox testing and all of that stuff before it becomes part of a production <laughs> release, right? So yeah, so I'm, I'm with you 100% uh, on that. And then just as a, in a closing statement, as a, as a funny thing, I, I, sometimes as I sit here, I'm actually closer to you than I am to Dave, and then somebody else will come up and I'm more like Dave than I am to the other guy that's speaking, so I, I kind of change hats here a little bit. <laughs> But I've seen crashes on programming because somebody changed a logo. Somebody changed a logo on a screen that comes up. And because the logo was different, the passing of information back and forth changes from text to an image. And the program's not designed to do an image. And the whole thing crashes. And then people are backing up trying to go, what, what happened? And then if you want to play Colombo and try to backfill to try to figure out it was the logo that did that. I mean, nobody wants to go through that stuff. So that's why I agree with you. Everything has to be sandbox tested and it has to be bulletproof because not only do you want the upside of the benefit, but it has to be drop dead good by the time it actually hits the marketplace. So that, that that's my hit list, so I, thanks again. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think you touched on a couple of things that I didn't kind of get into that level of detail, but yeah, certainly, um, you know, packaging changes that make sense in a, into, a, into a common release is really um, a huge part of the strategy, um, especially not just from the functional side, but also on the technical side. Uh, because different functionality touches different components within the system and you want to make sure you're not spending too much or too little time testing some of those and you don't want changes that overlap. So if something does happen, you want to be able to isolate where and why, right? You don't want to be scratching your head because you've touched so many different pieces um, that you, you can't isolate the, the defect. So yeah, thank, I, I really appreciate the, the comment. Is there another comment or question? 
Mr. Peters. Yes, uh, Mr. DeRay and uh, interested parties, I'm Charlie Peters, clean air performance professionals representing a coalition of motorists. The issue with the PZEV, I first became aware of that in the year 2000 when Ward's Automotive, which primarily reports to people in the manufacturing industry, et cetera, reported on the Nissan implementation of the PZEV. And we felt that there was a significant opportunity to make improvements in the year 2000. That's two decades ago. We've discussed this issue on a continuous basis and found huge opportunities to improve, and there's been some real progress. Thanks in part, in significant part, to you, Mr. DeRay, and paying attention to it the best you can. But it needs some support from different arenas, and some people need to be involved in order to make the system function better. I noted today that this is about getting the car to the new car dealer so he can fix the car for free. I'm sorry. Anybody that should be able to fix that and fix it right should be able to do that job. So telling the customer he's got to go get something for free when there's a, a person there in a competitive marketplace that can provide that service and do it right, hallelujah. No, this is not about referring the car to the new car dealer. It's about informing that there is a warranty and there's an opportunity here and somebody ought to pay attention and fix this and help to manage it and get the outcome. We've been working on this for a long time. It's very exciting to be here. We're very honored to be able to participate in this process, but we think it's really important to the survival and the effectiveness of this, the people in this room in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Peters. Thank you, Clay. Now on to an entirely different subject outside the smog program. I always try to mix it up and get our agenda uh, beyond smog. Uh, and thankfully, we've got a really excellent presentation that we saw um, uh, just a month ago when we had our all hands in enforcement division training with all of our field representatives and all of our enforcement staff uh, coming together, as I said, in Visalia of all places, but um, had a really nice presentation from Jake Rodenroth on Advanced Driver Assistance Systems, ADAS, otherwise known as ADAS, and beyond. Jake is with Aztec Technology. Thank you and welcome. Thank you for having me here today. Yes. All right. Well, let's go going here. So, um, you know, start the first slide is uh, a humbling one. Um, the U.S. is uh, in its third consecutive year of 40,000 traffic deaths. So there's a tremendous amount of people that are being hurt uh, in automobile accidents. Uh, personally, in my job in Aztec, I, I work with the car companies very close. I was actually with uh, FCA, Fiat Chrysler, on Monday. So, uh, you know, I think that there's no secret that we're a distracted public, that we've got our, our face on a phone rather than the, the road. And I, I think that a lot of this technology is trying to protect us from ourselves. So, you know, it's, uh, it's a pretty scary uh, statistic when you think about it. And when you think about um, the market that we service, we work in the collision repair space. These are the newest vehicles in the worst shape. So a lot of times they're working on vehicles that are on the first tank of gas. And, and a lot of cases where even the consumer is not aware of how that technology works, how that vehicle is supposed to behave. And it creates a tremendous challenge for the repair. Uh, the repair is facing things for the very first time. You know, fundamental repairs that we were taught as children, as, as technicians, you know, things like uh, disconnecting a battery, changing a windshield. Uh, I heard you talk about tires. Uh, things like that have changed in recent years. And when I work with shops, I ask them, do you research how to perform a four-wheel alignment? Do you research how to change a tire, how to change a windshield? And those are the things on these modern vehicles that have changed. So advanced driver assist systems uh, are only getting more complicated. It seems like there's more and more technology putting, being put everywhere around the vehicle. Uh, it really is, re uh, regardless of where that vehicle's hit, it could interface with a piece of technology that is either, either a fuel-saving mechanism, uh, it's comfort and convenience, uh, for a consumer, things like you know audio systems and navigation and things like that, 
or it could be a vehicle safety system. So, uh, you know, certainly around ADAS, there's a, a lot of talk around, uh, you know, the safety systems, right? I was a Mercedes Benz master technician. We actually had a, an S class that would detect sm uh, foul smells and emit a fragrance in the vehicle. So it just goes to show you that there is no, uh, no limit to what a car company is capable of in regards to technology. High-end vehicles have uh, up to 100 million lines of code. There's only uh, 60 million lines of code in all of Facebook. Uh, you get into passenger jets that we fly on and they're not nearly as complicated as some of the cars that we drive every day. So the, one of the drivers behind ADAS is automatic emergency braking. And the, the interesting part is it doesn't matter uh, what trim level you buy. O OEMs are starting to put this technology into base model vehicles. And there's no standards. Some of the vehicles come to a full stop. Some of them mitigate the braking. They all perform a little bit differently. As you can see by the chart here, every OEM's just got a different way of doing it. It creates a tremendous challenge when you're trying to duplicate the customer's concern and how that vehicle's supposed to behave. So you take a case like the Audi A8. Now this is not a car that everybody will work on. Uh, it is a restricted vehicle as far as uh, the, the type of parts you can buy for it. Uh, but you look at some of the systems and some of the computers on board. Uh, it has a laser on the front that actually detects potholes and can stiffen the suspension on one side of the vehicle to absorb the pothole. So uh, very complex. Uh, here's a look at the suspension, you know, very, uh, very intricate. And you know, that's where I tell shops, don't assume that you know it. Don't assume that you've changed that control arm before, that you've put that steering column in before. Research every vehicle because the repair procedures change early and often. On the uh, fuel saving mechanism side, it's a 48 volt electric system. Uh, it's an industry first electric supercharger. Uh, you know, these are all new things from a technician's perspective uh, that now we've got to interface with when we service these vehicles. So I like this uh, diagram. Um, my mother is an infectious disease specialist, so she works with really bad viruses like HIV, Ebola, uh, really nasty stuff for the human body. And one of the things is, there's a lot of parallels and there's some things that are different. In the human, in the diagnostics of the human body side, the host hasn't changed a whole lot, right? But the medicine and the technology has changed. In the vehicle side of thing, the host and the medicine and the technology has changed. So, you know, her and I uh, have a lot of fireside chats, if you, as you can imagine. And uh, one of the things that we talk about, she said, let me ask you a question. Would you diagnose every human the same? And I said, wow. I said, you know, we're all a little different. You know, you might be allergic to something that he's not, right? We all have different blood types, right? So really those diagnoses are, are written to us, right? Not just people in general. And so really vehicles are starting to go that way in regards to the electronics that are on board, certainly the vehicle substrates that the vehicles are built out of. Uh, I ran a Jaguar aluminum facility for 14 years. We were working on aluminum intensive Jaguars and Land Rovers. Very different vehicles than their steel counterparts. So our entire repair process was completely different than a steel, than a steel vehicle. And now you're adding electronics on top of that. And as I mentioned, there's no standardization. So when you think about it in, this, in the context of that discussion, are we really so different? We really should be diagnosing each vehicle, each impact, and certainly how that vehicle uh, is, is behaving. So ADAS calibration is uh, obviously a big hot topic, uh, especially in the collision repair space where we're interfacing with this technology on a daily basis. Aztec has five full-scale calibration centers. Um, I think if uh, our CEO was sitting next to me, he would tell you to not go buy this uh, because it's gonna continue to change. So this picture was actually taken in January of 18. Four months later, we're ripping the floor out to put the alignment machine down into the floor. Uh, that floor is actually a giant dry erase board so that you can write the measurements of where the target needs to be on the floor so it shows up in a photograph. Uh, you know, test drives are uh, nothing new to the mechanical side, but definitely something on the collision side that gets overlooked. And it's certainly, they try to bundle it all together that one test drive gets it all done. And really, it's about what system is being serviced. You know, obviously, traction control and ADAS are, you know, have, may have a different requirement. So when you're dealing with third-party payers, you're dealing with consumers, you've got to really show your work on what you did there. Um, in this wonderful state of California, I know that we have a little bit of a traffic problem here. Uh, so certainly, getting miles per hour achieved for that system could be a challenge. So you may need to go out into the, uh, out of the metropolitan areas where the traffic is bad and get to an area where you can complete the test drive safely. 
Uh, ADAS calibration, you can see, is uh, quite literally strings and plumb bobs at this point. Uh, a lot of manual um, measurement and things like that, a lot, high margin for error, and it's very time consuming. So uh, we, we believe it's going to change in the coming years. So some examples of repair versus replace concerns. Um, you know, you look at it like, well, that quarter panel looks like it was repaired successfully, right? That it's ready to be painted and given back to a consumer. However, it failed the radar test uh, for blind spot monitoring. So there's only five degrees of tolerance for Lexus and Toyota vehicles in blind spot monitoring. So it's not a whole lot. So an additional step in the repair process that a repairer's gotta be aware of, otherwise they get to do the job again. Uh, yes, even painters are not immune. Uh, there's been a significant change in bumper covers. 85% uh, of all collision repairs involve at least one bumper. So now we've got OEMs that say, if there's any damage to our bumpers, do not repair our bumpers, right? Uh, we're monitoring mill thickness of paint on the bumpers. Uh, one of the things I've noticed in this state, if you guys, uh, those stickers that the hybrid and EV vehicles have, there's, you can see the location on this Audi. This one does allow you to repair the bumper cover, provided that it's 25 centimeters from the, uh, the radar area. So if you change the thickness of the plastic between the radar and the outside world, you could affect the way it works. You could get removed snow warnings, and uh, we don't see too much of that in California, right? So those are the kinds of things we need to be sensitive, and certainly you know, bumper stickers and things like that, we need to be really careful. As certain OEMs uh, point that out as a no-no. So understanding ADAS calibration and the requirement. Uh, it seems like when people uh, in general get confused, we go to Google and we go to YouTube, right? It's like, hey, how do I hang that ceiling fan? And we go to YouTube, right? And unfortunately, in vehicle repair, that happens as well. So, uh, you know, this gentleman, uh, the look on his face kind of says it all. Uh, <laughs> he's got the Honda approved uh, step ladder there, right? And, you know, the bad part is there's, it's 80, 88,000 hits on YouTube on this one video, right? And then I look on Google and I see that everybody's got kind of a different way. Everybody's got, there's a cinder block and uh, let's see, step ladder, step ladder. That's a microphone stand maybe, you know, everybody's got a different way. So when you actually look in, in Honda Tech Info, what the specification should be, there's the target. Quite a bit bigger, right? And then you look at the specification, it says 1.97 inches from the floor. It also says to grid out the placement of that target according to the size of the vehicle. So an Odyssey would be different than a Ridgeline, a Ridgeline would be different than an Accord, right? And you can see in the video, he had it right around the door handle. And it's like, you know, how's that vehicle going to respond? Yeah. You know, and the bad part about calibration is you'll never know when you're wrong. It'll simply calibrate to whatever value you set it at. So it creates a, a big concern, as you can imagine. Uh, parts create a problem, too. And it's, uh, it's not that we don't want aftermarket parts to have a place, uh, but in certain cases, it creates an issue. So this is a, a Audi Q5 uh, camera calibration. As you can see, a very intricate target from a Volkswagen Audi group in the front. Black and white are camera targets, and then you have cone-shaped would be a radar target. And then also, if you can see, I know that's tough to see, but I'll put a dot, that right there. That is actually a Doppler uh, from Volkswagen Audi group. And what it does is it creates a radar signature that the car can see. So we mount that at the taillight, and then we go into the scan tool, and then it, it can see the radar signature, and we get passes or fails. Wow. So as you can see in the scan tool, it's giving us a false positive. It's telling us that that target is in the wrong place, right? Well, if you looked at this target, it is, like everything else German, just completely over-engineered and very uh, complex, right? <laughs> Lots of levels and tape measures built into it. It goes in one spot, right? So... Our technicians fought this car for about four hours, and uh, they're looking at the camera, we're looking to make sure the shop had plugged it in properly, uh, that the bracket on the back of the windshield had not been chiseled off and transferred. That is a one-time use part, it goes with the windshield. Um, and then there's aftermarket windshields that some of them have that bracket as well. So we confirm the angle of the, uh, the actual camera. Here's a position statement from Audi that says, do not use aftermarket windshields on our cars. And as you can see, this is a non Audi windshield. And, you know, immediately you think of forward-looking camera when you're looking through a windshield, right? Well, heads-up display can be affected as well because it has a reflective property so that the heads-up can be seen in the windshield. Uh, you don't want that to have a, blear, a blurry appearance when you're, when you're driving down the road. So, voila, we put an OEM windshield in and the vehicle passes calibration the very first time. 
So, it, you know, we find that we can get the same vehicle side by side in our calibration center there for the same exact calibration, right? One car will take 20 minutes, the next car will take four hours because you have the vehicles maybe not repaired as well as the other, right? And there's certain things that create problems uh, with ADAS calibration. And the bad part is that the service manual is written around a perfect vehicle, a vehicle that hasn't been hit by another vehicle or hit a stationary object, right? So vehicle measurement, vehicle alignments, all of those things, certain things in collision have to happen before measurements and alignments are done, and we're seeing ADAS calibration happen that way as well. So I'll share this one for you when things go bad. I, I don't know what happened, but uh, my sister and I, we were cute kids. So she calls me and she says, big, big brother, I've got, a, I've got a windshield I need changed in my Mazda CX-5. And when you're the, chi the car guy, girl, or the family, you know, you get those calls, right? Where do I go? What do I do, right? And despite being involved in the very early in the process, I told her, I said, make an appointment at the dealership, put an OEM windshield in the car, wheel it over to service, get it calibrated, and everything's, and life is good, right? So I thought that's what was going to happen. And, uh, you know, I'm on Facebook, and I see a guy changing the windshield in her driveway, right? And as you can imagine, I got a little excited, right? After we had a family discussion that she was going to go to the dealer. And so I called her. And look at what the consumer says. She says, nothing like getting your windshield replaced during the middle of the workday, but at least it will be done. And she smiles. So there's my sister, and there's my comment. I said, they can't replace that windshield in your driveway. Call me. Now look what the consumer says. Dude, I did what Mazda said to do. Apparently that's not correct. Again, never again. When things go bad, everybody loses. Yeah. The OEM, the shop certainly the insurer. And I, you know, I asked the shop, I said, do you think she buys another Mazda again? You know, it puts a bad taste in their mouth. And that's a basic operation. Windshields have been ch changed since the car has been around, right? But it's an operation that's changed. So the repair procedure on that windshield, on that Mazda CX-5, and a mainstream vehicle was 27 pages long. So they've taken the time to read through all of that, right? And it's just, it's just a bad situation. This example uh, goes to show you that everybody in the automotive ecosystem is facing ADAS calibration for the very first time. It's, it's collision shops, PDR shops, mechanical shops. Everybody's dealing with it for the very first time. Uh, a, fairly, a fairly small repair on this uh, Honda. Fortunately, the shop did do the research. They found that the bumper cover should be replaced because it has radar. Uh, there's the statement from Honda that actually says that. And you look at the mounting location of, of the radar. It's the first time I've seen where automotive repair has body structure component and it has a mechanical component to it, right? Yeah. ADAS calibration is not just one or the other, it's really a blend of the two. So that mounting location plays a critical role in how that radar is gonna behave. So here's the actual dealer invoice on this vehicle. It says customer states the blind spot monitor and check the blind spot monitor to make sure it's working as it should. And the technician said, all good, tested the cruise control and lane departure. Cruise control and lane departure is not blind spot. So really they picked the wrong system. They didn't address the customer's concern, right? So when we work with the collision shops, I want them to be able to audit if this vehicle's been performed, uh, this calibration's been performed properly. So when you look at it, Honda says, make sure the suspension has not been modified, that the tire sizes and pressures are correct. The fuel tank is full. If you want to fight from an insurer, put a fuel tank receipt on the bill. It's absolutely what you'll get. And even in the calibrations we do, we have to, we cross that one early and often. If the vehicle's been involved in a collision, a four-wheel alignment is required. And like I said, how many shops research how to perform an alignment, right? That's a step that has changed in recent years. You can also see the space requirements. It's huge. 21 feet across, 11 feet in the back. It's not too many shops that have that kind of space without cars in it or people in it or pieces of metal, right? So those are the kinds of things that uh, we're faced with as an industry. Uh, we work very close with SEMA. So this is a look at our calibration center there in Plano, Texas. Uh, SEMA brought us a modified DT chassis Ram truck. And this vehicle was 35 millimeters too high. So the lift kit and the wheels brought the vehicle too high. We could never get the camera to calibrate as a result. I think it was more likely to pick up airplanes than cars. <laughs> so you can see that the way this system works, uh, it actually talks to 11 different controllers in the car, including the brakes and airbags. So it's not just the radars. It's quite literally on a network and they talk to everything. 
As you can see, the procedure is very detailed. We have to take pieces of the mirror apart, confirm the angle of the radar before we calibrate. You have two types of calibration, static calibration, dynamic calibrations. All calibrations have a static component to them. So you can't just go get in and drive, connect a scan tool, and think you've got it. You've got to actually perform some measurements and confirm that the radar is pointing in the right direction before you calibrate. So there's no memorizing this stuff. You can't use 30 years of experience or even 10 years of experience to uh, think that you've got it. You've got to be really good at looking at service information and digesting that information into parts and paper. So as you can see in the service manual on this truck, it warns the technician about aftermarket add-ons, things like brush guards and tent and uh, you know bug guards and things like that that could obstruct the view of the camera and prohibit this vehicle performing as designed. So modified vehicles, it's not just the lifted trucks. Uh, the low riders go the other direction, so you could have problems there. But certainly you have modification to conversion bands. You have uh, handicapped vehicles, right? Vehicles that have been converted into mail trucks and things like that. Uh, the modification on these vehicles do interface with ADAS and is something to be a concern. So to walk you through, this was just an example that a shop sent me. This was a quarter panel replacement, heavy damage to the suspension. And what we're trying to show the shop here is how to research thoroughly what's going on with the car, even basic operations that they've done for years. So I heard uh, the previous presenter talk about tires, right? So would they research how to change a tire? Probably not, right? When you look in the manual, you see the trash can. It tells you to take that bolt and throw it in the trash can. It's a one-time use part. Right? That's not throw forward in the trash can, that's just the part in the trash can, right? Mm -hmm. Every OEM has a different identifier for their one-time use parts. And it seems like that list has gotten bigger in recent years. Uh -huh. So in the parking sensors case, this vehicle has the ability to self-parallel park, and it uses the parking sensors to do that. So if you replace the bumper cover and don't perform what they call an azimuth test, very few people know what that is, even when you're dealing with dealerships and service technicians. If they don't go through that test, you could have a failure. And it actually tells you to set up targets around the back of the parking sensors and measure response times in milliseconds. So none of this stuff is easy, uh, but the good part is there's really good direction on what to do. As you can see more in the suspension repair of this vehicle, lots of trash cans, one-time use parts, do not use air tools on me, things like that. It's very visual. Um, and then at the end, I mean, we've changed suspension for years, right? Here you go, calibrate suspension system. Use a scan tool to adjust the ride height calibration. So you're seeing more scan tool supported parts than ever. Anybody got an automatic lift gate on their vehicle? Uh -huh. May require a scan tool to replace that component. Uh -huh. So lots of those kinds of things. Now here's the alignment. Four wheel alignment, nothing special, right? Gives you the specifications of what the alignment should be, but here's the change. If equipped with lane departure system, camera alignment is required. So there's a whole lot of calibrations, I feel, that get missed uh, because they're not looking at this specification. So to wrap up, uh, you know, the cars are not going to get any easier than they are today. Uh, and today, they're not that easy. So as you look at the future, electrification is certainly upon us. Everybody thinks of Tesla, certainly. Tesla's getting ready to get some serious competition from major brands. And these vehicles are just very different. They, they use AC Freon to cool the battery pack. They have very intricate cooling systems, so you won't just squeeze a radiator hose and think you got it, right? So you're, you're, there's gonna be a lot of electronics and a lot of scan tools involved in the future. Uh, this is a look at the e-tron, which is the new SUV from Audi. Uh, I was recently on a visit with Volkswagen Audi and they took us to lunch in this thing. And I'll tell you, it's amazing. There's the engine. So you got one of those on each axle. So the future of your technician will change, uh, but it'll be heavily revolve around specification and researching service information and understanding it. My last slide, as an industry, we've got to lay our swords down. I think there's too much fighting between insurers, shops, consumers. We all got to work together uh, to ensure these vehicles are repaired properly. Thank you very much. Wow, Jake, that impressive uh, presentation. Thank you so much for coming out here um, from Texas. And um, once again, uh, um, we had a, 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 as I said, we had a, we, we were so impressed when you came out and met with our folks last month. Thank you. Uh, we just had to bring you out again to meet with our advisory group. So, and maybe there'll be another opportunity down the road. Any questions, comments for Jake? Yeah, Mr. Jeff Cox. and. I'll get to John next. Well, uh, 
Do you have suggestions on where to find the best information sources specifically for aftermarket? So um, I know Hunter is putting all of the four-wheel alignment uh, ADAS pieces within the alignment machine, but some of the stuff you have in here, really great pictures and stuff. Where's that stuff coming from? So every bit of the pictures that you saw were directly from individual OEM from service OEM. manuals. Uh, the good part is that they offer a day pass option. So in Honda's case, it's $10 a day, right? So there's, uh, there's some aftermarket third-party information providers out there that offer more of a subscription-based service. Um, and certainly, you know, there's one of them out there, in fact, that if you can't find what you're looking for, they have a library request feature, which is helpful. Uh, that would revert back to the pictures that you saw. So, you know, the, the point is the, is the, the information's out there. Um, we just have to be thirsty enough to go get it as, as technicians. Do you, in your experience, is there an information provider that's doing it better than anybody else? No, I mean, I look at it like they're all, they're all kind of level. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm an OE-centric kind of guy, so I look at, you know, the OEM information is really the best one for me uh, to put a little collision repair spin on it for you. The aluminum F-150, when it launched in 2015, uh, they changed the bedside procedure, how to change it, four times in a year. So, you know, shops shouldn't print something and say, wow, we learned a valuable piece there and saved that for the next car. Just get really good at looking at it on every car uh, because there could be changes, right? And so um, I look at it like I was a, a Mercedes guy, I have a Euro background. So I took it upon myself to learn more about domestics and more about Asians and things like that to understand not only their scan tools, but their service information. Uh, because it's critical when you're assessing damage on those cars. Yeah. Thanks. Sir. Mr. Gallo. Great presentation, Jake. Um, it really takes me back to a lot of conversations that my friend Gene Lopez and I have had a lot of conversations on, on the whole issue of collisions, lane departure issues, alignments. Yep. And, and for, the, for the sake of not trying to create more work for ourselves, but I think it really begs the question that the advisory really needs to take a look at putting together a standard for something that used to be a basic alignment right. that now involves all the sensors, all the lane departure d devices, all the things that my friend Mr. Lopez and I spent a lot of time talking about over the fact that you can't just go in and get an alignment. If yep. you don't center the vehicle and do all the sensors, do all the other things, you haven't done the job right. right. And so I really think it would be in the best interest of our group to really take this and take the information you provided and really take a look at it. And I realize that sometimes we, Pat knows, we go through on this all the time, but just something as simple as when we were working on the air conditioning standard. Mm -hmm. You know, at one point that thing was almost three pages long. It was like 27 steps and we're like, really? Somebody's gonna crawl underneath the dash of a minivan and check that out? I don't think so. Let's get real about it. But I think given all the sensors and the way technology is going with the vehicles, if you're gonna change a vehicle with something as simple as putting a bumper sticker on it, I think we really have to, as leaders in the industry, take a look at what we do to create a standard that the customer leaves with a vehicle being fixed right because yeah. we understand all the information that's tied to it. Yeah, in my work with OEMs, I'm really pushing them to embed more videos in their service manuals in regards to how the targets are set up. Uh, show me what good looks like, show me what bad looks like, right? Um, those kinds of things so that as a technician, we know that we executed the repair properly and certainly documented the repair properly. I think that that gets lost in the conversation too. When I work with repairs, you know, I said, help me understand why I should pay you to perform that repair if you didn't document it properly. Right. If you did a road test, shoot me, you know, print me a, a picture of the map. Show me miles per hour, direction, miles, all that kind of stuff. It's kind of like your math teacher used to tell you, you know, show me your work. You know, and that's, I think as technicians, that's where we've got to evolve. Thank you. Nothing more over here. Let me get someone new and then we'll come back. Um, Mr. Kusa. Oh, you haven't spoken yet. Sorry. Yeah, but go ahead, Dave, and then I'll, I'll catch up. Thank you. So, 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 many, so many things to say. Jake, thank you. Um, so uh, we've been, ASCCA, we have a, a Connected Cars Committee, been following this for a number of years now. So um, just the, you know, back to your slide with the person in the car, the significant difference is there is the person talks, yeah. right? So <laughs> makes it easier on doctors, I think. But anyway, right. um, 
building on what John said, I think it's going to be more than just a set of standards that we need. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, the example I use all the time is, right, I'm going to get a phone call that says, hey, Dave, my windshield's broken. How much to fix it? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say, let me call you back. And I'm going to call you back and say, well, you need a factory windshield. We need to calibrate. It's going to be $1,500. What? The guy down the street said $799. Mm -hmm. Who's going to get the job? Yeah. The yeah, 799 job, right? Because this aftermarket glass is not getting calibrated. It's probably going to work, right? I have a friend that has a Honda CRV that's got lane departure. Side view mirrors get busted off all the time on garage doors, so yep. on and so forth. I can go on Amazon and buy a brand new replacement mirror for 50 bucks, right? Right. Doesn't have the camera, but she's going to have her side view mirror, right? So, right. so how are we going to ensure? Says you know the the smog check stuff. You know these these are. Um, repair standards for in the mechanical side, right, generally are the, affecting the car, right? These systems not only affect the car, they affect me, you, everybody else, right? Everybody else on the road is in peril if the system on my car doesn't work, right? Right? Because, I, again, the, the, the lifted truck that one of my customers has that when he parallel parks it, it puts it on the curb every time because right. it's three feet taller than it used to be. So, so. We're, I think that we need to start looking at, and it's probably outside of regulation, it's probably going to be legislation, right, which I hate to say, but somewhere we have to ensure that these cars work, yeah. right, when, that they, that at, at, you know, we have the two-year smog check program, maybe we need a two-year ADASH check program, I don't know, but, right. you know, as an industry, I think this is something we need to look at because um, it's, it's going to be, it's a big deal, right? I mean, you know, I, I've seen three and four demonstrations, and I, I know of almost no shops, even dealerships that have... 20 feet in front of the car that doesn't include the car right yeah. so that's a 30 foot spot right the floor is flat and level and clean there's not you know a machine over there and a poster over here and you know a hoist with the car going up and down so nobody's got that kind of space so um uh so there, there needs to be so the bottom line is a lot of this stuff's not going to happen yeah unless I'm, it's in it's you know i didn't mention this insured. i didn't mention this but 30 percent of the four radar and camera calibrations that we do fail mm -hmm. 50% of the blind spot calibrations fail, right? For the vehicles that are performed in our environment. A lot of the calibrations that we see fail are an environmental failure right. because the environment, like you said, was not right because there was a lift or there was something like that. But even in our environment where it's perfect, I can control, it's an absolute level floor. We've checked that. I can control the lighting seven different layer, layers, right? So in a perfect environment, we still get failures because the car's got a physical issue. It was involved in a collision and it didn't get measured. Mm -hmm. Certain things in collision have to get measured, have to happen in order to get a measurement approved, right? right? Yet when that vehicle's constructed on an assembly line, every one of them is measured, right? And so same thing with alignments, right? Those are, you know, those two things, you don't know if they're right until you check them, right? And it's the same thing with, ADA, with, with scanning and calibrations. You won't know until you check it. And, you know, a little bit of a pushback on that they don't talk to us. They do talk to us, but it's a different way of listening. So in other words, every OEM has their version of telematics. Everybody's heard of OnStar. So OnStar will actually push updates to a customer in a diagnostic health check and say, hey, you have a diagnostic alert. You need to go to your dealer, right? So the car is communicating back to us that there's an issue, right? And we can see their tire level. We can see their oil life percentage, all those kinds of things. Yeah, it doesn't come across the radio and say, Dave, I got a problem, right? right? But it does talk to us in some form. And so that's why we have to be really keen on listening into it and, and making adjustments. Yeah. Yeah. So again, just, just to close it out, right. That, um, you know, in, in the repair facility, right. If I call you up and say, you need this certain thing and it costs this much money, or otherwise this system's not going to function, right. Your automatic braking, your automatic cruise control, so on and so forth. Yep. You say, no, I have to give you the car back. Right? right. And that's, that's what we, that's our law in California, which is fine. Yeah. I'm not complaining about that. Yeah. But, um, you know, there, we need, we need something that says, no, Mr. Consumer, Miss Consumer, you have to fix this car. It's not safe to be right. on the road with this system not functioning. Yep. So. I agree. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rice. Um, a, few, um, a few bag meetings back, I remember making the comment that we, we got to help these guys. Just like your, your comment here with that last picture, put your swords down, let's get together. We're all in this, we're all in this boat together, and we got to figure it out. Right. Um, I think this is, and, and Davey made a comment earlier, and I was thinking the same thing, um, th this is our next smog check. It, it really is. Yeah. So as we've moved from getting our hands around how smog check works and, and all of the time, energy, and effort we put into that, we got to move over here and do the same doggone thing and have a full-scale program 
based around this, it's too important not to. It's just, it just is, you know. And the last thing I wanted to ask you, if you have any thoughts or feelings about, because I could see your one picture that you had, I think it's interesting, you had a bunch of Audis in here. My kid just got an Audi, so I'm going, oh yeah, there's my kid's car again. Um, <laughs> I design. could see cars being totaled yeah. more because Absolutely. the cost to do these repairs are so high, right. even though the price of the car is high, yeah. you're you're not going to get anywhere with this because there's too many there's too many moving parts. Yeah, so you're almost better to throw it away and get another one, you know, because it's it's just too hard. Right. So so I don't, I don't know if if, if you've come across. Yeah. That so or not. that's a message to the OEMs as well, and I, I bring that. So, you know, don't make your cars uninsurable. You know, if you think about it, right? And everybody quickly goes to a $3,500 radar. they like, hey, th those radars now increase the cost of the repair. Well, so does a non-repairable frame rail, right? I, I think uh, Mark's got a tremendous information on the, on the Honda where it's got a non-repairable frame rail. And that means even just a little bend because of the, way it, the, the metal that it's made out of, right? So now you've got a car that was fully repairable in 2015. They made a platform change in 2016, and now that part is non-repairable. So now your claim severity just went like that, right? So it's a blend of, yes, the technology, but also the substrates that the vehicle's made of, right? And as you get towards, you know, you figure about ADAS where it started really ramping up, 2011, 12 timeframe, right? Now you've got a $3,500 radar that you need to know, pre-repair, is it gonna calibrate, is it gonna work? Because if it doesn't, then you just added a $1,400, $1,500 repair to the end of that vehicle and potentially get into a total loss situation. So it, you're right, it, it's, and it's twofold. We gotta educate insurers, consumers, and shops. Thank you. Comment. Thank you, uh, Mr. Robinette. Yeah, comment about that as well. Thank you, Jake, that uh, very informative. Uh, to Mr. Cox's uh, concern earlier about where do we find this information? Is there a standardized place we could go? That sort of thing. Uh, training is gonna be a moving target with all of this uh, design changes, the equipment needed, the sophistication of the cars is changing, so too will the sophistication needs of our technicians. The learning curves that they'll be moving through. And there's a lot of different places we can go, as you're well aware, to find that information. But for folks that are just starting on that path, that learning curve, it's not always easy to find that information. Right. There are some collection points, some traditional collection points. All data, iCar has some. There's some several, several of these traditional spots where you can find collision repair information to this point. But those, even those companies, ICAR included, are trying to stay ahead of that as quickly as it comes out to make that available. So it'll be a moving target for everybody. There is no, um, there's no destination on this that's foreseeable. I think it's gonna be a, a work in progress as we go forward. So I think too, as the conversation has been building around identification and awareness, so too will the conversation about training and their ability to actually do the repairs on the vehicles. Yes, there will be some total loss conversations, some cost of repairs versus value. All of that is part of the equation, but also part of the equation. You can have all the equipment in the world, but if you don't have a functioning uh, ability to take that information and use it and apply it, our technicians will be very, very unable to do the work. Yeah, ICAR has done a tremendous amount of research on um, vehicle by vehicle, literally platform by platform, and put that in a search engine that a technician could go to and say, here's the name of the system, does it require a scan tool, is, does it set a DTC, is there a target, right? And it's a quick reference that, hey, you better go look in the manual on this one because it's very intricate, right? And so to his point, there's a lot of resources on their website alone uh, that would help a, techno a technician from a quick research uh, perspective. And they offer a lot of classes as well. So, you know, there are, there are ASE equivalent in collision. So they do a lot of things to, to help us along in collision. Thanks, Dave. Mr. Molodonov. Oh. Hi, Jack Molodonov. Just, just, I'm sorry, just following Jack. up on what David said. I'm sorry, Jack. Yeah. Um, um, so, so there is right to repair, right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're supposed to be entitled to information and that kind of thing. And, and this is more a comment for Pat, I, I think, uh, here. Um, we have to, historically what happens is the manufacturers, dispense their information to the dealership network, and then somewhere after that, it filters down to where rip, uh, regular repair shops can get their hands on this information. Right. I think we gotta figure out how to shorten up that time frame so when it becomes available from a manufacturer's basis, we all have access to it as quickly as possible. Right. Sorry. 
Oh, Jack. Your turn. Jack Molodon from behalf of the California Auto Body Association. Very good presentation. Thank you. Mm-hmm. you. You made a comment when you were talking about the targets. You said that you never know if calibration is wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, so are you saying that the shop can calibrate and on a target and it may be the shop may feel like it's it's done yeah, correctly so, and yeah. then but it's not right is that what you said yes so uh we have a we, we <laughs> we've we figured we call it pole dancing so what they do is they take the target and they say uh about here's good right and they set it down and they hit calibrate right and the car could pass or fail and they'll move it right and then they can get up until they get a pass but when you look in the service manual there's an actual measurement that must be performed on a reference point on the vehicle. So you're gonna establish a center line, right? And then you're gonna go so many millimeters from the front face of the radar out, and that needs to be measured. And that's why we have the floor that you can write on, so you can write that measurement out, whatever it is. Uh, if it's a dynamic calibration where the vehicle's driven, uh, in the Ram trucks case, we have to take a measurement from the top of the tire to the bottom of the fender, and then enter that value into the scan tool so that it knows in millimeters how high the truck is, right? So if you miss that step, vehicle will simply calibrate to what value is in there currently. And that's what I mean by that, is you can't just look at it and say, well, yeah, we've done these all the time, the target goes here, right? You've got to actually measure it out by platform, even within the same manufacturer. So those camera targets, for instance, Toyota has three different ones, a 120 millimeter, a 160, and a 180. So on the car you're working on, which one, which one do you need, right? And if you just go grab one, potentially you could have a failure or a problem or worse yet, a pass when it's not right. Okay, thank you. Any others, Mr. Parra? Yes, uh, thank, thank you for the presentation. Um, so before uh, we had talked about it, there was some mention about possibly incorporating uh, some kind of certification into the brake and lamp um, to address ADAS. And I think that should be revisited and maybe you know brought up again where you know, I, I, I appreciate the, the um, the thought of maybe you know implementing this into like a full-blown uh, smog check program, you know ADAS program, but I think that um, um, you know for, for vehicles, there's going to be vehicles that are going to be damaged and then brought back into service. Right. So if we have a brake and lamp uh, certification already that, did, that 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 looks into that, then I, I think that we should maybe look into having uh, an ADAS style certification or, or level incorporated into the brake and lamp certification process. And, and I think we, we've talked about that before, we mentioned it, and I think it just kind of got tapered off a little bit, but I think that should maybe be brought back into the discussion. Yes, um, we have had some discussions on that, and uh, we will need some legislative help to get us there. Um, right now, we're just limited on the lamp and brake, limited to lamp and brake systems, but um, I think we certainly realize and appreciate the need for uh, an extension of that to other safety systems and features of the vehicle, um, not the least of which is the the ADAS systems. So, uh, yeah, we're gonna we'll probably have some discussions along these lines. I know that uh, there's uh, there has been some interest from the legislature, but um, and bills have come and gone. But um, I think before too long, we'll have to think about of getting some uh, some attention back on this topic. Because BAR can't do it through its current regulatory structure without without the legislative uh, mandate to do so. Okay, other questions, comments? Mr. Peters. No one on the webcast? No? No, I've been checking periodically, but nothing. <clears throat> Always makes you wonder if it's actually working, right? Hey, my home. <laughs> yes, Mr. Peters. Yes, uh, Mr. DeRay and uh, interested parties. Uh, very interesting uh, presentation. And the presentation, from my point of view, is since I have a very myopic view of some of this stuff. Uh, there's a part of this that's a real opportunity that we may not be addressing, which is the stuff between people's ears as being the really critical part of being able to accomplish the right outcomes here. 
We're using technology to tell us whether it's good or not. And scanners and computers and so on. But the most effective, most important computer on this planet is the stuff between people's ears and a professional's experience and knowing what's right and getting appropriate guidance and auditing to make sure that the results are appropriate and empower people to be the integral part that makes this thing work. Because I'm hearing lots of technology answers, but I'm not hearing that people are the part that'll make it work or not work. I've heard a lot of, oh, we need to go to smog check policy. Smog check results sucks. It stinks. It's awful. The opportunities to improve are immense by incorporating the people part. We need to do the same thing here. We're at the point where we have, we, we're showing huge pictures of cars in, in, a, in, a, in a neighboring state that got into an accident with a truck. And they put band-aids on the front of it and put people in it and are driving it and driving down the road and putting people at risk, their business at risk, and showing us how not to do this. We need to get back and incorporate the people part of this and figure out how to manage this in a way that gives us the right outcome that is what we really want. Because I think we may be missing that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think maybe I didn't represent Aztec too well today. So I'll tell you, we're a technology-enabled service company. So I have 550 ASC certified technicians because he's absolutely right. It's really the blend of the, the, the correct tools, the service manual, and the skill set of the technician to execute uh, a proper repair. So he's right. The, the human element uh, cannot be lost. And, and that's a piece that, you know, when things go, uh, electron, electronics break too. Scan tools aren't always working properly as well. So a technician's got to be really hip to understand when that's happening and make their appropriate moves. I'm going to have you paint your face half blue and half white <laughs> next time you make <laughs> right that <there>. presentation. <laughs> uh, yes, Mr. Lopez. Chief Duray, advisory group. Jake. Mr. Dean. Yeah, it's good to see always, you. Always good to good see, see you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that presentation. One concern that um, I thought of could be um, in the complaint environment. And Jake didn't um, touch on this, but some of these devices can be disabled by the consumer, by the uh, operator and driver of that vehicle. And we have to be concerned about that as well in that we don't render a vehicle un unsafe. And so um, vehicles can come to us with these devices disabled. And we have to have a consultation with that consumer uh, in that, we, um, first the consultation begins with, um, do you understand the ADAS systems on your vehicle? And you'll get that deer and headlights in the deer look at you, it's like, oh, what is that? And well, do you notice when you get too close to another vehicle, you'll get a beep or a vibration. Oh yeah, I shut that off. <laughs> so um, the concern could be that complaints may come about um, in a couple of different varieties. And, and one might be, I told them not to turn it on and they turned it on anyway and da 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 da. So I, I just wanted to bring that up, that, that, that some of these devices can be dis disabled by the consumer and we should be aware of that, especially when it comes to a complaint situation. Yeah, good comment. Yep. Yeah, the closest parallel to that is traction control. We're 2012 and newer our vehicles under 10,000 pounds. All of them have traction control. And they see that traction control off button, right? Mm -hmm. So he's exactly right. On the left-hand side, you've got blind spot monitoring, the ability to turn it off, the collision avoidance, the ability to increase or decrease its sensitivity, right? So he's right. I think as part of our check-in process uh, as repairs, we have to understand, does that customer use those systems? Do they, are they aware on how to turn them on, turn them off, uh, and certainly confirm if they're, if they're available and working properly? Yep, absolutely. Excellent observation. Thank you, Gene. Um, any other comments? Uh, yeah, Mr. Robinette. For AI, right? Right. <laughs> AI is coming. Yes. So they'll uh, they'll be monitoring how we drive, where we drive, yep. under the conditions, things that were turned on, turned off. The black box is all there as well. So we'll be having conversations about ADES, information management, black box training. It's all going to be a big, big conversation. Yes, sir. Anyone else? Thanks again, Jake. Thank Excellent you so much. Job. Yeah, appreciate you being here.
Thanks. Uh, this is also an excellent opportunity to remind everyone something I should have done at the beginning of our meeting today that we are going to, following this meeting at 2 o'clock in this very same room, we have a regulatory workshop. Where is it? On our collision, it'll be the second public workshop to discuss proposed amendments to regulations related to auto body repair. And I hope uh, many of you will be able to join us for that. It's scheduled from 2 to 3.30 p.m. again um, here in this room. All right, our next presenter, uh, can't get too far away from smog check. We're going to get back to it right now. Um, Greg Coburn from our engineering and research branch has a couple of presentations. First, this is an update. The first one is an update on our uh, implementation of the a uh, program that we told you we were going to roll out in July, which we did, and we'll give you some data on how that's been going with our permanent diagnostic trouble codes, PDTCs, and then we'll follow that up with um, some other enhancements to the smog check program that we're looking at. Um, so let's start off with the PDD, I can't even say it, PDTC implementation update. Thanks, Greg, for being here. Yeah, thank you. And I just wanted to thank you for putting me after the ADOS presentation because everything I have to say will seem so much simpler now. <laughs> so this is good. All right, so PDTCs, the Permanent Diagnostic Trouble Codes, uh, rolled out July 1st, 2019. Um, the basic standard is, is if you have a Permanent Diagnostic Trouble Code um, in the system, um, you're going to fail smog check unless you've driven it for 15 warm-up cycles and 200 miles. And that's just to kind of let people out that have been driving around and the system's not quite sure what's going on. It was kind of a get out of jail free car is the way I tried to explain that. Um, so it allows times uh, for the codes to clear or reset. Um, we're continuing to evaluate the standard to make sure it's working. So far it looks pretty good, but we want to keep watching it and making sure. Um, you know. I guess maybe the big update I'll step back to for a second is, you know, BAR's gotten a few calls on this, obviously, with any rollout. Um, we do appreciate all the feedback we've gotten from in interested parties and the industry and consumers. Um, the number of comments we've gotten are very small. Um, so most of them have run up through engineering in our field offices and been successfully dealt with. So um, there's definitely been some, some minor holes and things that we've dealt with. Um, a few cars that had some weird things and we went in and got them fixed very quickly and got the consumers through those situations. So in general, it was a very successful rollout, um, didn't cause a lot of harm to folks and people seem to be dealing with it. And I'll go through kind of some examples of this as we go through the presentation. Um, one of the notes is, you know, this is the standard, this 15 warm up cycles and 200 miles. So what does that look like? So vehicles that had a permanent diagnostic trouble code at time of smog check that actually failed, the average of them um, half of those vehicles had four or fewer warm-ups done on the vehicle and traveled less than 40 miles. So again, indicating either the codes were cleared or a repair was done and the codes were cleared and they went immediately in to go get their smog check inspection, didn't really give the car enough time to actually diagnose what was going on with it. So this standard kind of says, all right, go out and drive it around. I'll give you guys a little bit uh, a better slide with some more information as we go through here. Uh, we're still evaluating... Um, how we can use this permanent diagnostic trouble codes to reduce our reliance on readiness monitors. I mean, I think readiness monitors has been one of those things in our programs that makes it very difficult for consumers to understand. What do you mean, my check engine light isn't on, shouldn't I pass? Well, no, because the system's still diagnosing itself. You don't have all these monitors set. What's a monitor? You know, people don't understand that. So on these vehicles that have permanent diagnostic trouble codes, if there's nothing there, why are we checking the monitors? And so that's one of the things that we're looking into with ARB is can we reduce that reliance? So the vehicles that support this technology, can you make it simpler on the consumer to understand smog check? So that's kind of the next thing you guys will be hearing about over the next couple of years as we're looking at can we, can we use this to make, it, make the program work a little bit simpler? Oh, and we're doing ongoing analysis uh, to identify any manufacturer problems with the PDTCs. Um, there are a few out there. We have been dealing with them. We let them know very quickly when we see issues. We make sure it's bypassed in our thing and try to get it, the information out there to the industry with what's going on in our OBD reference guide.
Can you advance me through, Zach? All right. Now it went. Now it went double. There you go. All right. There we go. So what is the status of the PDTC failures? Um, so again, we're talking about 2010 and newer model year vehicles. Um, and just to kind of help you put that in perspective, so that means basically you got two model years that are in the biennial program, and then you have change of ownership and initial end of the state inspections in here. Um, so we had 225 uh, vehicle inspections in the first month that we rolled it out, so in July. So of those um, fails without PDTCs were about 9,500, about 4.2% failure rate. That's the general smog check failure rate for those vehicles. Um, PDTC, PDTC only fails. So that was about 3,000 vehicles. So it was another 1.4% uh, failure rate. Combined, you get about 5.6% failure rate for those vehicles. Again, we're talking newer vehicles. Um, so that is about approximately 100 PDTC failures per day. Pretty small, again, small fleet of vehicles we're talking about so far. Um, but to give you guys an idea of what does this mean as we go down the line? Well, PDTC, as these cars age and the fleet begins to turn over, um, that's about an increase of about a third on the failure rates, which is a pretty significant increase. So we're, again, we tried to, you know, as we were talking to you guys when we were doing this, we're trying to get it in early. We're trying to get stations ready for this. We're getting consumers used to it. It's kind of nice that we rolled it in as those vehicles really first came in to smog check. That's because we're only doing the two model years right now because the first eight are exempt on the newer end. Okay, and then right. more and more are gonna be coming in, obviously, yeah. Good point, Pat, yep. All right, so what does that look like? So I told you guys to give you a little bit better results here. So. What we did is we looked at the first month in July and we took all of those failures and said, all right, well, if we give them two months, what happened to those cars that failed for PDTCs? So within, if, when you give them an extra 30 days, 63% uh, of them passed. The, the, the PDC cleared and the vehicle was good to go and it passed through its smog checks. So either a repair took place or the car said, oh yeah, everything looks good and went ahead and cleared it. So that's good news. Um, so 13% of those were the bypass. So that get out of jail free card, that uh, the mileage and number of warmups, we allowed 13% of them to go through and they still have that PDTC set inside the system. So, you know, a fairly minor thing and we're again kind of keeping an eye on that and what's going on with it. So 7.2% went in for another inspection and failed again. The PDTC was still there. The number of uh, miles and warmups weren't met. And I'll give you guys kind of some examples of what's going on there in a minute. And then 16.5% just haven't come back in for inspection yet. They're still getting repairs, saving up money, whatever's going on there. All right, what PDTCs are we seeing? I think it's similar to what we had shown you guys uh, before we rolled out. Um, the big story on this really was EVAP. We don't require the evaporative monitors to be set to pass through smog checks, so we aren't testing that system. Um, so PDTCs do catch those, those failures. So surprisingly, or not surprisingly, the top failure reasons in smog check revolve EVAP and EVAP, and um, those vehicles are getting fixed. 42% of those PDTC failures are due to some sort of EVAP code. So it's beginning to get into, hey, we've got to actually repair these EVAP systems as they come through smog check. Uh, some of the other ones like mass airflow sensor circuits, and things are manufacturer specific deals that there are TSBs and things out there on. So it's really kind of forcing people to go into their dealer and get some of those reflashes done. Um, and there's some thermostat things, you know, just kind of some other minor stuff that needs to get fixed in the system. But the, the big headline is, is this is really hitting out, get, getting the EVAP systems fixed on these vehicles. I said I'd give you guys some, some better examples. So on the first day we rolled out PDTCs, we were kind of watching every vehicle as it came in and making sure that the system was all working and everything was going well, uh, making sure there was no issues. So one of the first ones that went in on, on the first was a Corvette. And he went into a station and we noticed he not only failed for PDTCs, but then went to another station just down the street and tried it again. Um, and then as we looked a little bit further, it was really odd because when you look back for the past uh, three inspection cycles, he has passed with the PDTCs 
set on the vehicle. Um, it, it appeared as though the, the car had either bad or no catalytic converters. Um, basically would reset his, uh, would clear everything and set just enough to get his readiness monitors just to set and then would go in and slide through smog check. Um, so the PDTCs really put a wrench in the works for this poor guy. Uh, so he basically cleared his codes at the station, drove it around some more and drove to another station and failed for the same reason again. So, you know, it's, you see things like that and it helps give you a little bit of perspective. We're not necessarily, you know, going after the person who's just driving down the road that we're all worried about. Um, you're dealing with people that have learned how to kind of game the smog check system over the years. We're so honest with how, what our rules are, what our failure criteria are, people always find ways around them. So this is just kind of another block that makes it a little bit more difficult for some of these newer vehicles to uh, evade the system and gives the technicians a reason to fail it. Um, you know, if it did have cats and they were just bad and the guy was monkeying with the system, there's no way for that technician to know what's going on. So this kind of helps that tech be able to fail it and get this car repaired and fixed. And with that, that was it. Questions? Thank you, Greg. Any questions or comments? Mr. Kusa? Uh, thank you, Greg. So one, just one question. On the 13.2 uh, the 13, 13 that bypassed, um, Two years, from now, two years from now when that car comes in for smog again, still has the PDTC in it, will it fail? Nope, it will still pass still bypass. as long okay. as it's still got those miles and warmups in there. And, and we'll be continuing to analyze that too and find out well, what's going on, why is that? Because that's some sort of manufacturer flaw or something going on if that's still sitting there. Thank you. Yep. Yes, Mr. Rice. Hey, Greg, how you doing? <laughs> Good. Um, so what's your expectation of the shop? What's the shop supposed to do here? I'm not, I'm not getting some marching orders from you as to what your expectations are of us. That's a great question. Um, so what we would really expect of the shop is, you know, explain to the consumer, hey, you have this code that's stored in memory. It, you need to drive at 15 warm-ups. You need to drive at 200 miles. And just kind of explain basically a warm-up is, hey, when you go out and your car's cold in the morning, and then you actually drive it and get it up to a normal operating temperature, you know, you drove it a few miles. You drove it, say, 10 miles or so. Uh, you, you, you got it warm. Do that for, you know, at least 15 days, and you've driven at least 200 miles. Go ahead and come back in, and we'll check it. And, and, but the reason why we really set that criteria, if you guys remember, we were originally going off the EPA criteria and it was quite a bit higher, more than double that. Um, we really did some analysis and said, all right, well, how long is it really taking for these, these codes to reset on the car? And so when you look at enough cars, you can start determining that doing about 15 worms and 200 miles, it should turn the check engine light back on, on most cars, not for all systems and not for all times of the year, but in general, that should allow it to repop that check engine light if there's really a reoccurring problem there. Other comments, questions? Okay. We'll move to your second of the two presentations. This one, looking at OBD system vehicle tampering prevention, some a proposal that we are looking to implement next July, I believe, um, to, I think it's the last of the OBD-related failure criteria, criteria that has yet to be implemented now that the PD, PDTCs have been implemented this year. There's one other regulatory criteria that we have yet to phase into this program, and you're going to cover that, I guess. Thank you. Okay, so we've got PDTCs kind of, we're working on it, but it's, it got implemented and that was a good start like Pat said. So now we're doing something called the Onboard Diagnostic System Vehicle Tampering Prevention. Uh, so thanks Zach for helping coming up with that title. Trying to make it uh, understandable here. So as you guys know, we've walked through this a few times. We've got these regulations that bar uh, promulgated and really began back in 2009. And I think Pat gave about the five-year rule uh, to get regulations through. Some went through a little faster than that, but it did take quite a while. Um, and basically the regs were saying starting on or after January 1st of 2013, uh, OBD equipped vehicles shall fail the, fail the OBD inspection if any one of the following conditions occurs as applicable to the vehicle. So I'll walk through some of these fairly quickly. 
Um, so things like, is the mill on? Is the mill functioning? Uh, is the mill commanded on? And are there DTCs in the vehicle? Would obviously all cause normal failure criteria. Then you get into kind of the more interesting stuff that we've been working on over the last couple of years now that we've got the OIS functioning uh, in California. The vehicle's OBD system data indicates the system has not yet been sufficiently operated to determine the presence or absence of a DTC. Uh, the purpose of that was obviously the permanent DTCs that we just went over, which were implemented July of this year. The vehicle's OBD system does not communicate with the EIS or OIS, uh, which we implemented uh, back in quite a while ago. Um, that was a carryover in the regulations. The vehicle's OBD system data is inappropriate for the vehicle being tested. That was a lot of the fraud stuff you guys have seen us give presentations on over the last couple of years. Um, so February 2017, we really started using that authority. Uh, and then the new one that we're talking about today, the vehicle's OBD system data does not match the OEM or CARB exempted OBD software configuration. Um, we're proposing uh, to do something with that by July of 2020. So a lot of what I'm going to be presenting today is not how we're going to do it, but ideas that we are looking at both with the aftermarket part manufacturers, with SEMA, with ARB, um, with other business partners as well as your, yourselves, um, to get feedback on what you guys think of these proposals and ideas and ways to move forward. Um, the idea is, can you find vehicles that have, uh, are in an illegal tampered condition? Can you find it using the OBD data? Um, sometimes a visual inspection when a lot of these new tampers are just a flash to the computer, you may not be able to see it, but there are fingerprints deep in the system that indicate there is something tampered with it. So again, trying to kind of use the data to, to find vehicles that aren't operating correctly. Uh, the, the rest of kind of that regulation, just because I don't want to short suit it, are basically uh, all the readiness requirements that have been implemented over the last, uh, last couple of years. So I think you guys all know those already. All right. So some of these fingerprints that we're talking about are the calibration verification number and the calibration identification number. So commonly referred to as CVN and CalID. So CVN and CalID currently BAR is using that, and some folks don't know that BAR is using it. Uh, we don't use it at a typical smog check station, which is why we haven't really talked about it, I think, in this forum very much. We do use it at the referees. Um, we've been kind of piloting this out over the last year, year and a half, um, making sure we've kind of got our ducks in the row. So we've got some statistical profiles that we use to kind of check out that cars are working right when they go into the referee. Um, and we check these also all with a human. So we put human eyes on every one of them to verify our models. And we've been doing that for a while now to make sure that we've got things down correctly and that we're applying it fairly to, to vehicles and to consumers. Um, but when they go in the referee, it's not everybody who goes to the referee. It's very specific cases that are prone to being modified vehicles. So if you've done an engine change and you come into the referee, one of the things that we look at are this Cal ID and CBN. We make sure that it's flashed to some sort of OEM or some sort of aftermarket approved condition um, with its flash, which is honestly, I think it's actually been a benefit to the folks that have done an engine change to some extent, um, because before it was tough to verify what it was and we'd say no a lot. And once that calibration really it hits a known good configuration, it makes it a lot easier to get them through the process. And they know what those numbers are. You can go out and look at GM's website and find out exactly what your number should be. You can take it in a dealer, they know exactly what it should be. So this has really simplified the process to some extent and being able to check those numbers when the vehicle supports it or that engine supports it. Um, other times when we're checking it, uh, if, law, if law enforcement pulls a car over, gives them a citation um, because the vehicle looks modified, um, they send it into the referee to clear the ticket. I don't know if you guys are aware of that or not. So when those come in, we do check that it's got an OEM configuration as well. Um, and we've talked about this in the past when we referee direct a vehicle because the OBD profile is not matched up properly. Um, those vehicles also get the CBN and Cal IDs checked because there's some reason why they obviously tried to have a simulator or something used at the shop on that vehicle. <clears throat> Thank you.
All right. So many modified vehicles not identified during smog check is why we're looking at this. Um, referee inspections identify computer programming modifications. Many other similarly modified vehicles are not identified. So when we're looking at the ref inspections, we do find vehicles that we would have normally just passed right, right by. And when we're looking at kind of those list of those three options, we're finding a number of them. There's no other way to find it other than looking at CV and Cal ID and other fingerprints within the OBD data to see that the vehicle's actually got some aftermarket tune done by a speed chop or something else um, that changes the configuration of that vehicle. Implement, uh, implementation of these automated CBN and CalID checks at the smog check stations will help identify and curb the use of these illegal programming on vehicle computers. All right, so we're looking at a number of different ways to roll this out. We, as with permanent diagnostic trouble codes, we like to kind of phase things in. We like to make sure there's low impact on stations, low impact on consumers, and get, and yet still have some impact on trying to clean up the air. So one of the things we're looking at is require CBN and Cal ID as priority data during inspection. So I, that's a little bit nuanced. When you have OBD data coming in through smog check, we don't require every piece of, inf of OBD information to come in from every vehicle. So we ask for it all, but we don't necessarily require it all. So if something happens on the vehicle's computer or the technician accidentally bumps his Bluetooth out or it gets bumped out of the DLC. If we got enough data, we kind of prioritize it and we say, okay, we got the main data on this car, we call it good and we move on with the inspection and issue a cert. So one of the things we've got to do though is if you're gonna use some of the CBN and CalID information, you've got to kind of lock it down and say, hey, we need to get some of this data. So we're doing some analysis to say, all right, how much of an inconvenience would that be? What type of failures would you get? What does that look like? So we're not sure we're gonna go down that route, but that's one of the things that we're looking at is can you set the priority and actually gather that data? So a lot of cars right now, we're not getting any CBN and Cal ID because of other conflicts going on. Um, could we uh, direct um, erroneously modified vehicles to the referee for verification is another question. Um, Focus an initial phase of implementation on vehicles likely to be modified or vehicles where the allowed CBN and Cal ID are clear and obvious. So obviously, you know, we've looked at what vehicles don't have these correct CVN and Cal IDs. Um, you're getting the normal tuner cars in there. So you've got uh, WRXs, you've got Mustangs, you've got F-150s. Uh, you've got kind of these normal cars we're all used to being modified and see coming into the stations. Um, CVN and Cal ID does a great job um, at gathering those vehicles. And the question is, do you just literally roll a program out and focus on those vehicles at the start of the program? Yeah. And that's really where BAR is looking right now. That's where a lot of our aim is, is can we focus on vehicles where we know 100% there are no aftermarket parts for that vehicle and those CVN and Cal IDs don't match anything that the OEM ever put out. So that's kind of where we're looking at starting and I'd love to get your feedback on that. Uh, and again, we, you know, as always, use the referee for any contested inspection. So if somebody has a problem, they say, hey, no, I've got, I've got an EO on this, on this vehicle, or there's some special circumstance going on with this vehicle, we'd obviously always consider that at the referee and make the best decision possible. All right, proposed implementation plan. Um, so target implementation date, I think we kind of wrote on paper, uh, we want to start targeting for July 2020 to kind of throw a line out there for that we can start shooting towards and getting everybody up to date on it and kind of push us to try and get something out there. Um, so that involves a lot of internal work. So developing online training modules like we did for permanent diagnostic trouble codes out there. Um, so just have free training that's available and letting people know through ET Blast, go take this, it'll help you be informed as to what's going on. Um, updating the BARS OBD reference document like we did for permanent diagnostic trouble codes again. Um, any anomaly vehicles or vehicles where, you know, there may be some special circumstance going on, go ahead and update that with TSBs and so forth. Uh, industry outreach, um, you know, doing industry presentations similar to this. Um, ET blasts, newsletter articles, um, Q and A's on the website, all kind of our normal, normal stuff we do. Uh, vehicle inspection report will have to indicate the cause of failure being CVN and Cal ID, which is why it's important to get uh, all the education out there. 
All right, future work. Accommodate uh, legally modified CVN and Cal ID. Um, so there's, you know, as you guys know, so CARB has an aftermarket parts process um, that vehicles go through and get certified to. They do not grab the CVN and Cal ID right now. There's been a lot of discussions with CARB and with SEMA and with aftermarket part manufacturers. Is there a way to do that? There's a lot of complications with it. Um, we're still working through it. Um, but with that said, there are a lot of ways to get that information. So what's really neat about SmogCheck is we have a lot of data. Um, and in that data, one of the cool fields is we actually ask for the EOs, and we've been doing that since 2015. And a lot of great shops out there have been giving us a lot of great data. They're saying, hey, this car has EO number whatever, and they, that's in the SmogCheck record. Well, I now have an EO record that's matched up with thousands of very similar cars with the same CVN and Cal ID. So now I can say that EO number appears to be this list of vehicles, this list of CV and Cal-ID. So we have some kind of some neat information that then we can bounce back off of those aftermarket part manufacturers, say, hey, here's what we're seeing to be kind of the, the range of, of uh, CV and Cal-IDs that work for your particular aftermarket product. So we've been working on some of those and trying to understand that better. Um, we've been contacting some of the aftermarket equipment manufacturers that are more common and kind of getting their feedback as well and saying, hey, you know, here's what, here's what we see. Can you guys give us a more comprehensive list of things you've seen internal? So, you know, if we do get that from them, we can then use that as another piece of it. And CARB's working on what that application is going to look like in the future for their aftermarket parts and whether or not they can include some sort of CVN and Cal ID in it. That's it. Thank you, Greg. Any questions or comments? Mr. Rice. Um, so, so, Greg, I'd like for you to say to me after I ask my question, no, no, but that doesn't happen. So if you just hang on to that for a minute, when I say my thing, <laughs> then that's what I want to hear, okay? All right. So I can see where this is, well, let me back up. Usually, we're divided into three groups. There's good techs, there's bad techs, and then there's some goofs in the middle, okay? And sometimes good shops can become goofs for a minute, and then get back into the good guys. And then sometimes goof, get more goof, and they end up with being a bad guy, okay? I think your design, this is designed to go chase the bad guys, which I think we can all agree, let's go get bad guys, okay? My concern is it's possible for a good guy to turn into a goof if the situation that you're looking for isn't fair to a shop. Okay, so let me ask my question now, okay? Um, is it possible for a defeat device to be installed on a vehicle. This is scuttlebutt that I've heard, okay? Sure. A defeat device to be installed on a vehicle, if it comes into a shop, if a guy is doing the smog check and sees a bypass or something on the OBD connector, the guy's gonna go, hey, hey that's, not, that's not right. And he's gonna, he's gonna know immediately that something is not right. But somebody who is more sophisticated may be able to install a defeat device behind the scenes and a tech would never know that. And by the time he does a smog check, he's just moved from a good guy to a goof and didn't even know it. Is that possible? So that's a good question. It's a little, little bit, I, I, wanna, I wanna separate the two issues a little bit <laughs> and, then, and then we'll address the best I can. And someone may come up and just start answering it for me here. We'll see. Uh, so, <laughs> So we've got CVN and Cal ID, and regardless of what they install, that does not change anything. So let's kind of put that discussion aside for a second. I think what you're asking about is, could you, could you install some sort of simulator up under the dash? The some sort of defeat device, something else that the tech couldn't see where it's up under the dash and they plugged into something and they really plugged into uh, another defeat device or simulator or simulated vehicle up under the dash. They aren't actually talking to the car. And could that happen? And you know, the real answer is, is that we've done a lot of work in looking at that. We've obviously been on a number of court cases and things looking at that exact question. Um, so those simulators that have been claimed that you could put up under the dash, you can see them all very easily. So yes, could that happen? Yes. Do the stations that have claimed that those are up under the dash? Are they showing fingerprints of what's going on? No. So you can tell there, there's multiple things that kind of help you be able to see it. Things like, well, what is the voltage like? Mm -hmm. um, those types of things aren't 
simulating what actually could be. It's plugged into AC power in the shop. So if you can tell that you've got the thing plugged in and not running off of the car's battery or off of a battery that's standalone on the device, I think you're kind of proving that no, the shop was working with the consumer. And when you see it repeatedly on car after car after car, I think that again kind of leads to, well, gosh, are you just having one consumer? Is this, where are these devices coming from? Because every car you do has the same thing going on every failure. So I think there's been a number of things, and obviously there's a lot more to all of this, bud, but there's, no, we are not seeing that. Other states have seen some of that stuff. There are fingerprints. You can see that you're talking to the wrong thing there. So uh, BAR's doing a better job at blocking certs in California, which has made that kind of less than some of the other states are probably dealing with. Um, and once it's cert blocked, there's really no harm, no foul to that, that station per se. So if they're doing it on a onesie twosie basis, but I think you know our enforcement department obviously would be working with those shops one on one if there if there was an issue. Thank you, Greg, for that explanation. Uh, any other questions or comments? This direction, this direction. Yes, Mr. Kusa. Thanks, Greg. So um, there's a lot of handheld, you know, where you can download, reflash. It grabs the, the, the factory flash, stores it, and then come smog time, just reverse the procedure. Will that show up on, on CVN or, or Cal ID? No. no. So okay. as long as they flash it back to that OEM. The flash factory OEM, team, right. You, okay. you can have that same clean for a day dilemma going on. Got yes. It. Good question. Others? So what's next? July 2020 will be July upon us before too long. Uh, I'm sure we'll have a, a more defined plan first part of next year yes. if we're going to move forward or not. Okay. We'll probably have another presentation maybe in April. Sure. Sounds if good. that's going forward. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Other questions, comments? Okay. Great. Greg, thank you very much. All right. We have our next agenda item, which is our standing uh, report on our enforcement statistics. This is uh, for the calendar, excuse me, the fiscal year to date, um, comparison of complaint trends in relation to our complaint trends for the same period last year, as well as some other uh, interesting enforcement data. That's just a handout. Uh, we used to, as many of you know, used to have Bill come up here and read through all of those, but we'll, we've got to be so, uh, got to be fairly routine to the, to the extent that we felt like it could just be a handout. So we've made that a handout the last year or more. Um, unless there's any questions about it, if anyone's had a chance to read through it. If not, we'll move forward. Okay. Public comment on items not on the agenda. Anyone? Anyone from the webcast? Okay. All right, we're getting close to adjournment and uh, a longer lunch period uh, between now and the work group. Thank you all. Uh, our next bar advisory group meeting is Thursday, January, does that say 23rd or 8th? 23rd, 2020. That's in this room? Currently it's in this room. Always check the calendar and the final meeting notice that will go out approximately 10 days in advance of the meeting because sometimes we have, we get bumped um, for other, for, due to other meetings. Um, but we are currently scheduled for this room, Thursday, January 23rd, 2020. The other meetings for the rest of the calendar year next year are also on April 23rd, July 16th, and October 22nd. And the exact location and um, times will be announced in meeting notices that precede each of those meeting dates. But check our calendar on our website as well. Yes, I'll read through them. January 23rd being the first one. April 23rd. So you can, July 16 and October 22nd. So you can book your calendars now. All right, any questions about the meeting agenda for next year? As always, we welcome topics for our meetings. Um, 
feel free to email me and or Zach, and uh, we'll do our best to accommodate the meeting request. If it requires us to reach out to another uh, department or agency, uh, we certainly will do so. I think Mr. Peters asked uh, that we try to reach out to the Department of Toxic Substances Control relating to the, um, the lead acid batteries, I believe, um, and looking at implementation of that new law as well as uh, kind of overall what, what the, what's being done on the, to protect the public health and safety relating to batteries and lead. Uh, I'll stop there. We will adjourn, reminding everyone, of course, you won't let me adjourn. Okay. What do you need? What would you like? Come on. Mr. Peters, did I pass over something or has that added something? No. Mr. DeRay and the interested parties, there's been a lot of news in the last week or so concerning significant fires in the Bay Area, shutting down the freeway, involving ethanol. How important is that to our environment? How important is that to our water supply, et cetera? And I would petition the state to get detailed information on that and further address that because it's not really clear what all that's about because I think it may be very important. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, reminding everyone, uh, getting back on the topic I was going to mention was that we are going to have a regulatory workshop on uh, proposals to update our um, auto body or collision repair regulations that'll be in this room at 2 p.m. today. And one last thing is all of the presentations from today's meeting will be posted sometime next week, early next week. Um, and with that, I will adjourn the meeting. Thank you all for being here and thank you for your patience and uh, uh, look forward to seeing you in January at our first meeting of the new year. Or at two o'clock, yes. Thank you, we're adjourned. <laughs>